The views and opinions in this program are not those of CESA 7 or Spectrum. I'd like to call this regular school board meeting to order. Uh, we'll start by taking roll call. Ms. Jones, can you please help us? Good evening, Becker. Here. McCoy. Here. Shelton. Here. Smith. Here. Vandenhuvel. Here. Warren. Here. Uh, six board members are present tonight. Uh, Rhonda Sitnikau had another engagement and wasn't able to make it, so she is excused this evening. Uh, next on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, again, if everyone could follow along but mute their microphones for ease of access and understanding, uh, we'll go to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll go next to the mission statement. I uh, forgot to reach out to somebody ahead of time to read this. Brenda, would you be able to read the mission statement for us? No? Did I call on the wrong person? Maybe. I just have, you know, too many screens up. Um, uh, yeah. I can go to somebody else. If go to somebody else. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you. All right. Uh, we educate all students to be college, career, and community ready, inspired to succeed in our diverse world. Thank you very much. And sorry about that, Brenda. I normally re was going to reach out to you ahead of time and just realized now I've forgotten to do that. All right, next uh, we'll go to our collaborative commitments. Again, these were um, adopted and created by the board uh, just over a year ago, I believe, uh, on how we want to try to run our meetings, uh, seven collaborative commitments. Um, we'll go around and have each board member uh, read one, uh, and I'll go around my screen and we'll start with Laura. Number one is we will strive to review board materials and seek clarifying information before board meetings. Thank you. Andrew, can you read number two and then we'll go to Christina. To embrace diverse views and perspectives as a path to effective solutions. Thank you, Christina and then Brenda. We will show consideration to everyone, fellow school board members, staff, students, families, and community members in our speech and behavior. Number, <clears throat> number four, we will consider the merits of ideas as the primary driver of our decisions. John? We will offer our comments efficiently and succinctly and avoid repetition in order to keep board meetings to a reasonable length. All right, and then I'll read uh, six and seven. Uh, we will create equitable and inclusive opportunities to promote community engagement. And number seven, we will engage in conversations in a way that allows for all perspectives to be shared, considered, and valued. All right, uh, with that said, we'll move to our open forum. Uh, we have two people who have comments that they wish to share with the board. Uh, the first is someone uh, that will call in and um, speak to us by phone. And then we have somebody who has submitted comments ahead of time. Uh, just as a reminder to people, uh, if you're interested in speaking to the board during a live board meeting, uh, there's a uh, access can be signed up ahead of time um, on our website. Uh, I just want to make special uh, mention to the fact that we do have a lot of people reaching out to board members through email, um, hundreds every single week. We're doing our best to, uh, to read and, and trying to respond to them as many as possible. Um, but if you don't get a response back, please know that uh, we appreciate your comments 
um, and we'll try to respond to as many of those emails as we can. All right, Josh, with that said, uh, can you help us out with the first uh, call in for? Yep. Um, I've got two different numbers on this one, so I'm trying the second one now. Okay. Denise, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Denise. This is Eric Van and with the Green Bay School Board. Appreciate you taking the time to call in. If you could start by introducing yourself and giving us your address, and then you have five minutes to uh, uh, speak to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Denise Seibert. I live at 883 Elmore Street in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And I can go ahead whenever you guys are ready. We're ready for you, Denise. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Denise Seibert, a parent representative of the Green Bay Area Public School Special Education Council. The council is a representation of parents, community members, and Green Bay Area Public School employees who review curtain issues and trends to promote family engagement. Our council's plan is to focus on disseminating information, identifying needs, and networking with families. We would like to address the board today with some positive feedback, as well as a challenge that has been experienced by our families and other families in the district. These items appear to be consistent across school and grade levels. Daily communication from the teachers and direct support staff at most schools has been incredibly positive and fluid. Families have stated that they are receiving manageable communication and resources to be successful as possible with virtual learning. We have also received feedback about challenges. A significant challenge for our families has been the lack of direction from district leadership regarding how IEPs will be addressed and implemented. Schools have been waiting for direction from the district. The district has been waiting for guidance from DPI. Unfortunately, this has left many families stagnant when it comes to their child's individual education needs. As a council, we feel strongly that the district must become a leader in doing what is right for our students and adjust the education plans to reflect positive support, supportive changes now as needed and once disseminated from, disseminated information is received from DPI. Doing something is far better than leaving families in the holding pattern many of us are currently experiencing. In closing, the Seat Council is looking forward to building a collaborative relationship with the board, as well as be part of building a better district community for our students with special education needs. The group would like to be included as a resource for families within the school district, as well as pro provide constructive feedback and direction to the board in regard to the district's Im impact on special education. We would also like to extend an invitation to all board members to attend our virtual meetings that happen the first Thursday of each month. We would like, um, we will be sending you all the copy of this statement and request that you include our council email in the meeting minutes. Is that all, Denise? Yes, not, it not, is, sir. Not, not is that all that, there's a lot of information. I just wanna make sure I didn't cut you off. That's Thank okay. You. Thank you very much for calling in and sharing your comments with us. We'll definitely be following up. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you very oh, much for your time, everyone. De Denise, are you still there? It looks like uh, Christina has a question for you. Yes, Christina. Yes, thank you. So, Denise, thanks for inviting the board to your meetings, and I'm just throwing this idea out there. Would it be helpful if there was one particular board member that will, like came regularly, or are you more interested in just sort of an open invitation in a fluid state? Um, either way would be fantastic. It would be wonderful to have um, one direct support council member, um, but we're definitely opening our doors for anyone that would like to be included in our discussions. We're not, you know, not singling anyone out here. So if anyone's uh, interested in wanting to be involved in what we're doing with the district, we'd be more than happy to have them. Right. The one thing I'll just uh, point out, Denise, is that uh, we would be limited in the number of board members that could attend any one given meeting so that we wouldn't uh, form a quorum. So um, okay. definitely we'll make the opportunity available and we can discuss the best way to proceed there. 
that sounds great, Eric. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Thanks for calling. Thank you. All right, have a good night. You too. All right, uh, and we have one person who has submitted comments that they had asked to be read, and I believe we have someone designated to read those comments tonight. That's correct. All right, go ahead. These comments are from Jennifer Bino, 3685 Connard Road, New Franken, Wisconsin. The subject is letter to the board on reopening. Dear members of the board, thank you for your dedication and support of our Green Bay Public School students and families. I am writing to you today as a teacher of the district and as well as a parent of three Green Bay students. Let me first say that I love teaching and I love my students. If you ask my colleagues and administrator, they would tell you that I am a professional with a positive attitude. I always look for the positive in every situation and advocate for our students and their families. I am not one to complain. I need you as a school board member to understand how detrimental it is that our students return to in-person classes. Virtual education is creating, creating more mental health and trauma to our students and families than a virus ever could. As a second grade teacher, this is what I'm seeing. One, above average students are doing okay. Average to below average students are getting most, almost nothing out of virtual education. Two, students are the most disengaged students I've ever seen. Students have learned already to turn off their camera or to take off their headphones and just walk away from the screen. Three, students are getting scolded by parents to watch the screen and sit down. Four, Parents are beyond frustrated that their children are not engaged and not doing any work during independent work times and not knowing how to help. Five, the students who do not thrive in whole class instruction are hating school more and more each day and becoming more and more disengaged. It is not getting better each day, it is becoming worse. Six, there is so much inequality for the students trying to learn at daycare with children running around and screaming while they attend class and they cannot focus. Seven, lastly, so many children who in the past love school now hate school, including my own children. Any person can give a 10 minute mini lesson to a whole class where everything is planned out and ready to go. But give them the differentiated instruction that they need. It is our time to use our knowledge and craft to reach each and every student and move them forward. Virtually, I'm working with as many student and small groups as I can, but there are so many barriers that it is not nearly as effective or enough. The gap is growing and we are only two weeks in. I teach at Weekly Oc Elementary, where we believe that hands-on learning equals engagement. We believe in using our school forest, garden, creek, outdoor classroom, and yes, even our school chickens to teach our students. <clears throat> Students are missing out on so many great experiences and we are teaching in the exact opposite manner as we believe. <clears throat> this is not hands-on learning. Students are not thriving. They are merely doing the bare minimum, if that. And how can we ask seven-year-olds to do any more than that is in this context? Meanwhile, schools within walking distance have their students in class five days a week and are thriving. Families, including mine, will not and cannot tolerate this type of education any longer. GBAPS will lose so many families and teachers if we do not make a change. Our students deserve better. We can do better. Sincerely, Jennifer Bino. All right, thank you, Jennifer, for submitting those comments and thank you uh, for reading them for us. All right, moving on to the agenda. Uh, the next topic, uh, we'll have a, a guest coming in. Uh, Natalie Bomstead is the executive director of Wello, um, and she can explain a little bit more about what Wello is. Um, Natalie, are you there? See, there she is. I am. Can Hi, you see Natalie. me? Oh, there I am. <laughs> Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. Um, so. Natalie approached me um, probably a month or a month and a half ago about a project that she is working on and I, I certainly will let her explain all of that. Um, it, it is our intention uh, to have the school district support this, but we wanted um, Natalie to come forward 
uh, and present a little bit more of the information and certainly allow the board members uh, to ask any questions. So with that, Natalie, um, I'll hand that over to you and uh, we'll go from there. All right, thank you, Eric, and thank you everyone for, for having me uh, with you to here today virtually. Um, as Eric mentioned, my name is Natalie Bomstead. I do serve as the Executive Director of Wello, and we are uh, a local network nonprofit that's uh, really focused on striving for equitable health and well being throughout the greater Green Bay area. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, back in um, actually the fall of 2019, the Wisconsin Healthiest State Summit was actually held right here in Green Bay. And part of that summit was um, a call to action across the state for communities to sign on to this declaration um, declaring racism as a public health crisis. Um, and at that time, we had been working with some of our, our state level partners to see how we could really bring that to the local Green Bay area and help connect that state and local work, as well as think through you know, what are some things that we can do um, here locally to not just declare something a public health crisis, but then to take action. So from um, that kind of initial conversation, we've been working with a few community partners um, across the area to really, um, you know, put this declaration into place, but then also to think through uh, what some potential actions are. So um, I'm really here today to, to ask that the Green Bay Area Public School District join our community um, in collectively declaring racism as a public health crisis uh, to recognize the harm that it has caused um, generations of, of people of color here in our community, um, in our state, and, our, and really across the nation. Uh, what we know from the data is that racism leads to shorter, sicker lives uh, for people of color in our community, um, in Brown County in particular, we see that um, white citizens live on average 16 years longer than black citizens and 18 years longer than our Hispanic citizens. Uh, in Wisconsin, we see infant mortality rates for infants of non-Hispanic black women in the highest uh, in, uh, in the nation. And racism does contribute to increased incidences uh, of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, mental health uh, issues, um, for you know, not only um, our adults, but also for our children. And in addition, hundreds of studies do document the negative impacts that stress uh, caused by historical and really continued trauma, um, stereotyping and prejudice against people of color um, can cause. Uh, furthermore, we did a, a study um, in 2019 um, that really looked at well-being across Brown County um, and in every aspect of well-being, we saw that um, uh, in terms of well-being, uh, well-being was reported lower for non-white citizens uh, compared to our white citizens. So we really have, um, you know, the evidence to support that, you know, this is really causing health inequities across our community. And so we felt compelled that, you know, to make this declaration was something um, that we, we really needed to do now. And, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions on kind of why does a declaration matter? You know, it's a piece of paper we're signing on. You know, why, why is that the starting point? Why, why should that matter? And I guess the answer to that is, you know, it matters because we can't start to really address something collectively and, until we name it, right? So the signing of this declaration is really a measure of progress. But we should really think about it as just a, a really a first step in more of a long term journey um, to really address the, the deep systemic issues that have continued to present, you know, health inequities, disparities um, that have really been perpetuated by racism. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we had kind of a very public um, press conference uh, declaring this uh, declaring racism as a public health crisis uh, with the city of Green Bay, with Purvey Health, and with a number of other um, organizations, um, both, uh, you know, business, uh, nonprofit, um, as well as our healthcare partners. And so we're asking the Green Bay Area Public School District to join in that effort today. Moving forward, uh, we want to um, kind of continue this momentum. Like I said, this is kind of the first step, and so we'd be looking to bring together groups um, to really focus in on what are some of those um, actions that we can take together collectively um, to really um, address the systemic issues that are causing um, the health inequities and disparities that we're seeing. So with that, I will, I will pause um, for, for questions from the board or any other comments. 
before we go on to questions, I just want to point out uh, that uh, we brought this uh, before our equity team here at the district. They've had a chance to vet it, so we didn't want this to be a top down, hey, we're going to sign this and go forward, but uh, the team has vetted all of that and it's our intention uh, based upon their recommendation to, to sign on to this. Um, if anybody has any questions for Natalie, we can take those now. Go ahead, Christina. Natalie, so what do you see moving forward from a partnership perspective here when, and I'll, I'll say when we sign, I'm gonna assume we will. You know, I'm, I'm really proud of the work that the Green Bay School District has been doing. We've been talking about the school to prison pipeline for years. We've been talking about racial inequities and inequities across gender, disability, and so forth. And this is really a, a serious issue. And so I applaud your work on this and the way that you're able to build those relationships in a collaborative spirit. So, you know, the, I, I'm here with you. What, what do you see happening moving forward now that you're building these relationships and getting other organizations to sign on? Absolutely. So from a, specifically from a district perspective, um, I know that there is an equity team embedded within the school district. So I would really see, um, you know, as we bring these groups together to really identify some key issues that we want to address, that we would engage with that equity team at the district level to ensure that um, things are, as we take action, that it is actually informed by community. Now, mm -hmm. there's a, a number of different ways that we can do that. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we talk about focus groups, we, we talk about, you know, engaging with community members on the ground. Um, Wello will be um, actually piloting a, a technology tool um, coming up this fall as well that will allow us to really try to engage more of the, the community that is directly impacted. So I think that's one of our, our key things that we want to remain conscious of is that you know, we are having organizations sign on to this declaration, but we know that action is going to need to be informed directly by people experiencing the disparity, right? It, it cannot be something that an organization, I can't necessarily say, well, is going to do X, right? Because I don't necessarily may not have that lived experience. And so um, to the extent that the district is um, able to really partner with us to, to engage with the community in that way, so that actions really are informed by lived experience, um, that would be you know, tremendous in, in terms of, of moving things forward collectively. Thank you. Go ahead, Rhonda. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry I didn't introduce you when you joined in. I appreciate no. it. I know you had a long drive today. Yeah, and, and I wasn't sure how my Wi-Fi would be, but it seems to be okay, so. Um, Thank you. Um, Natalie, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I'll start with what do you believe, um, have you had a chance to take a look at any of our policies or practices in the district? Um, and, and if you have, what do you, what do you think, or are you seeing anything that we could address um, like, like right out of the gates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question, Rhonda. I have not um, taken a, a kind of a deep dive in your current policies. Um, I think one of the things um, that organizations are doing when they sign on is it's both kind of a community commitment to look at what are, what are things that we can do together, but it's also an opportunity for also us to look internally and see as an organization, what are some, you know, low hanging fruit, so to speak, you know, is there a different way of looking at a policy so that it is more equity minded. And so uh, we are really asking organizations um, to, you know, to look at their specific context and their specific, you know, power that they have um, to look at that. Um, and I'm excited about this because several months ago or a few months ago, I actually introduced this idea when we can, we can pitch future board agenda items and I did that and hadn't heard anything. So I'm really excited that this is actually um, happening and I fully support it. Um, one more question. Are you familiar with an equity audit in itself? I mean, is that what you're talking about doing with the community? That's a great suggestion. So I, I am familiar with an equity audit. Um, currently, what we are kind of doing is spreading the word across the community to see how many organizations we can get aligned and signed on. And the intention is um, for this fall to convene and to kind of talk through what are some next steps. And I think an equity audit, you know, 
potentially that could be kind of the next step as a community. So we will definitely ensure that that is part of the conversation as we move forward. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Natalie? Uh, I saw Brenda and then Laura. Natalie, um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for your work on this. I, I'm really excited that we're, um, again, assuming we're going to be signing on today. Um, and I noticed that the uh, it's a statewide effort to, to have this done. So, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, is uh, um, will our district be part of state, or or does Wello represent our entire county? In the in the state work, or is the state just letting each of the areas do their own thing? And also, um, is there any funding that comes with this um, as part of the university system, or is that something that, if we were to do an equity audit, for instance, that that would be something that the district would pay would would uh, put the bill for? Mm -hmm. Great question. So it is a state level declaration. And so each individual entity can go on and sign as themselves. So, you know, if you go to the, and I can send, um, Eric, do you have the link um, available for everyone? Or I can send it along? Yeah, it's in our- Is it in your packet? Yeah, that's how I got okay. there, yeah. Perfect. So you'll see that every organization that has signed on is listed. So you, we will be listed as the Green Bay Area Public School District, not under the kind of under Wello uh, in particular. Okay. It does not unfortunately come with funding. You know, one of the things um, that has kind of been, I think, a little bit in the background with this being a state level initiative is to show the, you know, the overwhelming response that communities across the state are having to it and to see if it could potentially down the road, you know, is this something that we could apply for funding <laughs> for to actually get some, you know, get some action um, to take place. So unfortunately right now it is, um, it does not come with any funding per se, uh, but I do think that in the future there could be an opportunity to really um, even write for grants or different things of that nature. And with showing the Greater Green Bay communities, you know, overwhelming support and the kind of the rally around it, I think that um, that would bode well um, for us as a community to try to get some of those dollars to, to do and implement some of the work. Okay, thanks. And then this actually is probably more a question for Steve or someone in our district. Who will be from our district? Who will be part of, I, I guess, are we working with you, um, Natalie, if I'm understanding mm -hmm. that correctly, there'll be a, a group that works together on this. And so I'm, I'm curious who from our district is going to be part of that. Is it going to be one person, multiple people? Who, who are you kind of seeing as, as uh, spearheading this? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so Katie Salzer uh, serves as uh, the director for equity in the district. And so she would be a key person in that process. As you mentioned, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. We've got an equity committee. Um, we also have a group of administrators right now that's participating in the uh, AASA equity cohort over the course of the next year, uh, which is designed to link us with districts from across the country that are on a similar path. Um, opportunity to learn from them and other folks at the national level. So I think we've got a, a really solid core of uh, administrators, teachers, and staff members um, who are working on these initiatives. Uh, and so I, again, with Katie serving as that lead uh, conduit for us, I think we've got uh, we've got quite a bit of momentum here to connect with the work that Wellow's doing. Okay, good, thanks. Laura, did you still have a question? Yes. Um, so I fully support this, and I, I'm, it sounds like we're going to go ahead with this, and I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I can see that you are currently in the stage of basically building your coalition. Correct. Um, and, th and that's great. Um, what would be your answer to someone who might be watching this or someone in our community who um, isn't convinced that racism is a public health crisis? I mean, there's, uh, there's people like that who need convincing and, um, and I, sorry to put you on the spot, but what would you say to those? <laughs> what would you say to a person who, who looks at that and goes, that's, I don't, I'm not convinced. Um, uh, you must you must talk to people like this from time to time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I don't know, can you offer kind of what your response would be to that? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, Laura. You know, I think, you know, from my perspective as a, as a public health practitioner, right, I, I often will look at the data, right? What does the data show us? And I think, you know, it's very, very clear, you know, I mentioned um, over hundreds of studies that are directly, you know, linking and showing the negative impacts that are caused by racism. And so, you know, I really rely on, on good sound scientific data um, because I think that that, you know, helps. There, when we talk about race, we have a lot of personal emotions that are also built up in that in personal experience, right? And so as we think about, you know, moving forward together as a community, I think it is helpful to have some of that good science and data behind, you know, the decisions that we make. Um, but I would also really, you know, I guess, challenge people to think um, about, you know, life maybe outside of their reality, right? Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we've probably all heard about bias, um, implicit bias. Um, and I think that it's important for us to sometimes think about what the world may look like um, if we were, you know, whether that has to do with color of our skin, um, gender, or any number of things um, that can cause um, different stress um, in our lives. Uh, and so I think I would just ask that um, the community remain open, open-minded to um, maybe the different experiences that people in our community are having and how that is creating, you know, stress for themselves, um, you know, for their, for their families. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we all want our children to be healthy. We want them to be able to succeed. We want them to be safe. And so it's with um, those kind of common core values that we're really um, bringing this forward as a community. It, it's on, you know, it's with one of love and unity um, rather than um, kind of pitting different sides together. So uh, I think that's what I would, that's what I would say. <laughs> I, I, I get it. It's not, it's not easy, but um, we, there, there will be people who will require convincing, probably lots of people, and I, I am fully in support of this. Um, and um, I just want to thank you. Thank you. Rhonda? Um, I would add just that the fact that people need convincing is the reason why it's so important to commit to an address. All right, any final questions for Natalie? All right, Natalie, we will, uh, uh, Steve has the information on how to sign on. So uh, you will do that first thing tomorrow morning and um, we'll be in contact with all, any and all of our resources to help support that Wello is doing. So thank you very much for being a leader in this area and we look forward to standing alongside you and many other uh, organizations in our community. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. Thanks, Natalie. All right, uh, before we go on to the superintendent's report, I realized that um, I forgot to introduce some people. So we are obviously joined by Superintendent Murley along with members of his cabinet and then two members of our inner city student council, both from West High School, uh, Noah Becker and Lucas Pulley. So Noah and Lucas, thank you for being here tonight. Um, and with that said, Steve, I will hand it over to you to lead us through the uh, superintendent's update portion of the agenda. Wonderful, thank you very much. We've got four items for you tonight. Um, the first one is our uh, uh, next uh, opportunity to discuss the Green Bay Forward Plan uh, and what's next for us as we move through this school year. Uh, I've got several attachments on there. Uh, before I start with that, I think that uh, I, there's a, a lot of data in there and can be easy to get uh, uh, caught up in the numbers. Um, but I, I want to make sure that we reflect on what we heard uh, at community comment tonight um, and recognize that uh, we're talking about our kiddos here and their families, uh, our staff and the community uh, understand that uh, uh, this process that we're working through is, is difficult and challenging, um, has far ranging impacts for students and staff. Uh, we are very cognizant that uh, the best instruction takes place when Students are in classroom with teachers, uh, and that dyad between the teacher and the learner uh, is where the most of uh, effective teaching and learning takes place. And I just want to make sure that uh, we put that right out front. We recognize that that's the context 
within which we have these discussions. Uh, and, and we certainly do have lots of data and, and other things like that to, to cover as we go through it. But um, I think it's important that we remember that each one of those numbers is, is one of our kiddos. Um, so with that said, I've got uh, uh, several attachments here. Um, some will look familiar to you. Uh, we've got uh, the decision framework that we presented on the 19th. Um, uh, presented at the 24th, uh, dated the 19th there. Um, we also had Director Becker's uh, metrics motion um, from the 24th. Uh, some subsequent information to that includes both our uh, weekly updates from September 8th and September 14th. Uh, and then uh, a summary of the gating criteria uh, that compares uh, the DHS uh, uh, metrics and uh, the metrics that uh, Director Becker uh, uh, shared with the board. Um, on that chart, and what I'd like to start talking to you about is, is where we're at today and, and what I'd like you to consider. Um, on the right-hand side of that chart, it talks about um, uh, several metrics that are proposed by the Brown County uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, and, and I'd like to say that uh, I've appreciated the opportunity to work with them. Uh, I, I will express frustration with folks at the federal level and folks at the state level who have had opportunities over the past many months to provide some level of gating criteria for school districts and universities across the country and have failed to do so. Uh, unfortunately, this means that they have kicked uh, this problem down the chain of command and it has uh, for better or for worse, wound up on the doorstep of counties uh, and their departments of public health. Um, in our case, uh, I know having spoken with the folks at uh, Brown County that um, they were anxiously as we were awaiting uh, our State Department of Public Health uh, to adopt criteria. When they passed on that, Brown County uh, stepped up and began the process of, of developing criteria. We've been in constant dialogue with them as we move through this process. Uh, shared with them both what I knew from the DHS draft, shared with them uh, my analysis of that, shared Andrew's uh, proposal. They've also been in contact with Winnebago County and Outagamie County. Um, they've been in contact with our local area health providers, uh, and they are working to develop a multi-metric model um, that would be used to provide recommendations to Brown County school districts uh, for uh, the appropriate status uh, within their education systems. They are very close to finishing that. I was perhaps overly optimistic that we would have this last week uh, and that we would be able to include it uh, on today's uh, agenda and have a conversation about it. Unfortunately, uh, as you see on the right of the chart, um, one of the metrics is completed. Uh, I know what the other metric is, but I don't exactly know how they're measuring it. And I'm not sure about the other three data points. And so those columns are empty right now. Uh, I share all that with you as background because I have a concern tonight that I would like you to consider um, as we think about what appropriate next steps are for the district. Uh, it is very likely based on my conversations with the county that we are going to have a model from them um, perhaps this week. Uh, and uh, I am concerned that as a board, if we are to take action and adopt a gating criteria uh, tonight that we may be in a position where we are uh, then rolling it back uh, after the county puts theirs out because ours may be more or less restrictive at various points in that gating process. Uh, and I think that uh, in the best interest of not only our students but the county as a whole, uh, it would be beneficial to have one uniform gating criteria that could be applied district to district across the county. Uh, I would like, uh, based on my feedback from the county, um, for us to consider adopting that model when it comes out. Um, but absent its uh, formal announcement from the county yet, we certainly can't take action on it without seeing what those metrics are, being able to put them through the analysis and understanding how they impact our kids. So one thing I would like to do is I'd like to have the conversation with you tonight, but I'd like, you to, I'd like to ask you to consider um, tabling any vote on it until such time as we get uh, that detailed uh, framework from the county. Uh, so, as I said, uh, much of the information on there is familiar to you because you've seen it before. Um, the gating criteria chart, there's lots of numbers and information which we could spend lots of time going over, but I'm not sure we need to do that um, in detail at this point in time. Um, I thought perhaps now the best thing to do would be to uh, open the conversation up and uh, better understand your thoughts about um, working with the county on that uniform gating criteria across all school districts. 
Uh, Andrew, I'll call on you for a second. I just want to mention two things. Um, first, um, I'm trying to, been pay, uh, to pay close attention to what's happening in other districts because I think the biggest piece of feedback that I hear is, well, other districts are doing it successfully. Why can't we? Um, some of it is, is public information. Others, uh, I know, hasn't been public, but, but things that I've heard is that there are, are many, many um, classrooms that are, are quarantined that started in a hybrid or maybe all in person that have had to go to a virtual model because of, of the virus and because of quarantine and, and exposure. Um, and also believe that there are, are districts who are preparing themselves to shift to an all virtual model quickly because they're not being successful, mostly because they don't have the staff available based upon uh, quarantine metrics. So um, again, not what I'm hoping to see, but it's sort of what we predicted um, in the numbers uh, right now in our community are uh, are presenting that. And then the other thing is, I, I know that there would be a lot of frustration if we didn't adopt something. I, I agree with you. I, I'd rather not put out our own um, model and then have to backtrack that if we adopt a community model. We've already had a lot of inconsistency when we put out the 5% metric and now have said well, that doesn't apply anymore. Now we have more information. So I'm hesitant to put something out if we believe something better is going to come out. And then the only other reason that I would say that is uh, all of the numbers or any of the models that you look at, whether it be what Andrew uh, presented to us last week or DHS or any of the other models, the numbers in our community are so high that we're not on the verge of going to a hybrid model, um, regardless of which of these you're using. And again, I think other districts around us are moving in the direction that we already are. Um, so again, the frustration that we don't have the information that we've been talking about this for so long, um, but those are the reasons why I would be comfortable uh, tabling it. So I just wanted to provide my comments. Andrew, I'll uh, let you go next. Thank you. So a um, couple of things. First of all, there is no DHS model about uh, opening schools. They have a high, medium, and low, uh, high, moderate, and low criteria. They they obviously aren't going to apply them to schools. Uh, it was used as a starting point for discussion here, so I don't think that should be confused with an actual school opening metric. Um, one question before I have a few points about the merits of postponing or not. Uh, see, the Brown County draft burden rolling average is listed 35, 25, 10. Usually when numbers are listed like that, it's a reference to uh, average per day rather than a rolling seven. It's not a rolling, so in other words, the 10 would be 70 uh, in almost every model I've seen where they've used two digit numbers. Do you know for sure, are they really talking about, uh, really the average would be, I guess, we've used it universally, but really, the 14 day rolling thing numbers that we've talked about have been really 14 day rolling totals. So yeah, and that, that's a that's a great question, Andrew, to be perfectly honest with you. I know the categories that they're looking at and I know a very thin level of detail about each uh, based on my conversations with them. They have not shared uh, anything beyond that with us at this point. Um, in my last conversation with them, they plan to meet with um, some uh, folks to provide them some statistical expertise on uh, next steps. So um, what you see is, is what I was uh, uh, able to, to glean from uh, my conversations uh, with the county. So I don't have any more detail about that. I'm hoping that when uh, they come out with the final plan, um, they do have uh, significantly more uh, information to help us understand that. Um, I do know that those were the, the numbers that they shared. Uh, and, and the colors actually come from them too. Uh, but uh, applied to what, which I think is your, your key question there, um, that was not as clear. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, when they actually provide their model, we can see the specificity uh, with that. Okay, because there's, there's an overwhelming difference, obviously. It's either off by a factor of seven or it's not. Yep. Uh, 
if they're referring to it as usually, and, and I had to do a lot of this when I was comparing other, other states' metrics, um, many did use averages. Many did use 25 cases per, um, per 100,000 per, and so I had to multiply that out to make it what was truly a seven of, I made them all into 14 day rolling totals just to be comparing um, apples to apples. So I guess I, I am concerned if there is, I, I, I hope there isn't just a plan by members to pre-decide to adopt whatever the county is going to put out as a suggestion, having no idea what it's going to be. And I mean, they could put out, there, there is, I believe having talked to board members, all, all of whom, all of whom have sincerely studied this issue, I think there is probably not a metric that all seven of us would agree on in good faith because I, and, and that's fine. It's, um, that's why there's seven of us. If, uh, honestly, if, if a metric came back, what I proposed in the interest of hoping to find board support and finding something that was around the middle of what different states were, were doing, um, I was hoping to find something that you know, that could work there. If something comes back that is much more strict um, or is so, or is very heavily based on positivity, which we're seeing problems with right now because people aren't able to get tested who want to be tested, uh, which yes, that's part of why you look at positivity. I don't think positivity should be ignored, but if there's going to be some kind of formula here, I'm concerned that we could be just closed due to lack of, you know, lack of tests. Um, and by, by closed, I don't mean closed. By closed, I mean not uh, having in-person instruction. Um, I would be okay with postponing one week for a, uh, and calling a special board meeting, but one week is the longest I am willing to go before I think we must act. Uh, I would have never, spent the time creating and trying to find a metric that board members would support if the county had done it. Um, if the state had done it, um, but nobody, nobody did it. So I would be, I, I would vote yes on postponing if we can meet again in one week to talk about this, but if it's beyond one week, I'm, I'm not interested. That's too long and families deserve um, answers. Answers which, um, because it's an epidemic, um, a pandemic, uh, answers can change, which is also why I put a sunset in my motion last time. Um, yeah, because answers, answers can change. We may be fortunate enough that there's been some decline in the um, in the seriousness of infections from coronavirus, but we don't know enough to be sure yet. But so I think anything we do, even if it's adopting the county metrics, I think we should adopt it with a, a sunset clause um, in it. So, so that's where I'm, I guess that's where I'm at as far as any, um, Postponing, and then lastly, I just have a technical question that I'm probably done with metrics for now. Um, in this posted item about um, returning to in-person instruction, is this where anything that's not food service would be discussed under this point of the agenda? Yes, I would believe it would be. Okay. So that's all I have to say about uh, metrics. If I can just weigh in on that, Steve, I, I'm sorry, my camera is not working either tonight. I don't know. Um, it, it would have to be that it would be related to one of these items, Andrew, that are posted for the agenda, because if it's not listed here, then 
um, there wouldn't have been reasonable notice to the public we were discussing that particular item. So if it's related to one of the items that are posted, you can discuss it, but if it's not. It is listed here. I had this discussion over the weekend. Eric, I talked to you about this. Yeah, I, I mean, if you have a, a question about something that's related to getting our schools open virtually, I think you can ask the question. We don't um, have, you know, Steve is ready and, and whether he can answer something briefly or, um, you know, can follow up with the, the appropriate information, but I think you can ask that question. Okay, I, don't, I didn't know what the question is. Anime does not say reopening metrics, it says reopening of schools. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't have a discussion with anyone prior to tonight, so I didn't know exactly what you're asking, Andrew, but I just wanted to make sure that we understood it <laughs> related to one of the items that are posted. Yes, but it won't be, I'm just saying there's, you know, it's, it's, it will be related to something that's posted, which is, which is reopening schools returning in person but probably not. I mean, there are many things beyond metrics that are part of this, this discussion. Yeah. Let, let's stay on the metrics topic for now, and then, Andrew, you, you can ask your follow-up questions, and we'll go from there. All right, any other uh, questions or comments on metrics? Rhonda. Thanks. Um, so I have some questions and I have some comments. My first comment would be, um, Steve, you had mentioned that governments and institutions are kicking, they're kicking the can, right? That's what they're doing. I find it interesting that this is supposed to be such a black and white issue, but they are perfectly happy to live in the gray. Everyone is. Um, I just don't understand that. If it's, if it's, Something that's supposed to be definitive that this is, you know, the, 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 the fear of, of what will happen is out there. You would imagine someone would have created some criteria. Um, I would love us to be that someone. My question, my first question, is the county's potential criteria, is this something that districts have to comply with? So for instance, if you're, a, if you're a school out there and you already are in person and you're rolling with it, do you have to then roll back what you're doing? So it's, uh, it's my understanding from a uh, conversation with the county that uh, uh, so they were actually directly uh, comparing uh, this to Dane County. Uh, Dane County issued directives. Um, they said that they plan to issue recommendations. Okay. So what we'll get from the county will not be a directive, as I understand it. Okay, so it wouldn't be like we would have to, it wouldn't, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't seem like it would be a huge undertaking if we, for some reason, adopted criteria and then had to go do their recommendations if we felt like it. It, it doesn't seem like it's, it's a mandatory compliance issue. We have criteria. Now we have to reverse um, course and go with what, what the county puts out there. So just so that I'm clear about that, that's not something we have to do. No, and to Andrew's point before, I wouldn't want to adopt anything sight unseen without being able to uh, push the data through it and make sure that we understood uh, what it meant for the district. Okay. And if this um, was something that they were telling us wasn't going to be ready for a month or two, I would not be recommending that we wait. Um, but they had told us it would be ready last Friday. Um, so we're hoping that we get something this week. Uh, and so my thought process on that was uh, that we wouldn't want to adopt uh, a protocol that then a week or two from now, um, we're rolling back and, and changing to the county criteria if it looks appropriate to us, um, just because of my uh, thought process would be that we would be causing confusion um, where we wouldn't need to. Um, okay, but it is true that other districts have criteria or they have some sort of plan in place that they're using to make their decisions. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard for us if we even wanted to, right? We would have to first 
adopt that we wanted to. We would have to first approve that we wanted to. We could have our own criteria in place. And then if they put out theirs, it would be fine, but we don't necessarily have to take their, their criteria, correct? That's correct, it's a recommendation. It's also my understanding that other districts don't have gating criteria right now. Uh, at the last Brown County Soups meeting, that was actually a conversation. Um, no other districts have adopted gating criteria yet. They haven't, but they have, obviously, they must have some internal decision-making that they're, they're, they're working with. Um, I guess what I, what I think about and when I, when I hear, um, I know Eric was talking about having people are waiting for, for some answers and for some numbers, and they are. We continue to hear from people every day. We all receive the same emails. Um, what ends up happening when we don't actually have a stake in the ground is that people get to define that for themselves. And that creates more uncertainty, more distrust, more um, the, the lack of confidence with what we're doing because we can't make a decision. Um, so I would love for us to, to seriously consider the proposal that we discussed at the last meeting. And if, if for some reason the, the, the county criteria comes out and it's just, you know, blows us over, and if it, if it was going to blow us over, and if it was really worth considering in my own personal opinion, it would be a slam dunk, and then we would just do it. So I would like to see us actually move forward, seriously considering the proposal that we put out last time. Go ahead, Brenda. Um, yeah, I think I, like you said, Eric, our numbers are far away from bringing kids back to school based on Andrew's proposal from last week um, or two weeks ago. And so I'm comfortable waiting a week um, again, if, if Brown County is similar to what we've proposed, it gives us a chance to look at it, um, make some uh, maybe tweaks to Andrew's plan or not. Um, but I don't think we, um, again, I, it's, it's going to be a while before these numbers drop far enough to reach um, Andrew's numbers. So I'd, I'd go, I mean, I'd be in favor of having another meeting in a week. Go ahead, Andrew. And I just want to say I'm, uh, I'm flattered. I don't, I don't mind if people say Andrew's numbers. I just don't want it to be lost that this is uh, really me looking at things that were already done by a wide range of public health agencies and, you know, trying to find some middle ground. So, you know, it was a real legitimate state public health agency in Oregon that set a metric of 30 total cases per 100,000 in two weeks. You have to get below that to even open K through three. Okay. That was a legitimate decision of that public health agency. Uh, at the same time, there were uh, gaining criteria set by uh, respected public health uh, institution, Harvard Global Health, that are more than 10 times more permissive in reopening metrics. Okay, so it's not, you know, I didn't just grab something. So I'm, it's, I mean, it's fine if you want to say Andrew's plan, but it, again, it is you know, probably more accurate to, to say the somewhere between Kansas and Arizona plan, but if you want to say Andrew's plan, you can, but it's, again, this is, you know, there is, it's, it's troubling that there is such a wide range, you know, even among, even among respected health agencies and institutions and not, um, not necessarily all politics driven either. Some of the, you know, there are, um, there are states uh, with, uh, with political control of both parties that have come up either with very strict or very permissive metrics. Uh, Oregon and, you know, Oregon and Connecticut are both, both blue states and one of them is 
about the strictest in the country and Connecticut's about the most permissive. So I just hope that some balance, you know, some balance can be found here. And, you know, in the interest of, uh, I, I just, I can be okay with, with meeting in, in one week for this, but, um, but no further. And I think there's an effort on vote in, in one week if the county has not acted. No. Thank you, Mr. President. Let's see if I can un undo my microphone here. Okay. Um, okay, so a couple things. One, the county apparently already said that they released it on Friday, and then they didn't come up with it. So, yeah, I, I guess I do. I, I would appreciate the fact that it is being postponed to a definite time. Right, that's important instead of just whenever the county releases it. So at least if there's nothing in a week, that's better. Um, but I guess I, I don't see why this gets punted so often. Like I, if the so if the county is going to release binding directives, it's going to override whatever you guys adopt anyway. So whatever you adopt won't matter. And if the county doesn't release a binding directive, then it, it's just another one on a large spectrum of of acceptable and expert um, expert opinion driven metrics. I guess I don't, I guess we see that's the problem is like, I can't even argue too much because I, I don't know, I don't even know what it is. So that might be an argument for postponing it. It's just that people are starting to get a little nervous here with no metrics being adopted. I don't know what's going to happen next week. Um, we have a pretty acceptable, I would say, um, set of metrics in front of us so like if we keep it as long as it doesn't get punted again but see that's what is going to be in the minds of people is what if this gets pushed back another week if county doesn't release or something like that i don't know where the votes are for that but i'm just i'm just saying that it's a decision needs to come up at some point as far as what was mentioned earlier with the issues happening at districts that fully reopened that is true i i don't know if i would necessarily fully reopen a district right now with the numbers where they are um, and that's why you would be adopting a set of metrics, right? Whether it's, whether it's the ones you already have or whether it's the counties, it, you're not going to have the situations happening at schools that are fully open right now because none of the metrics I've seen would fully open your district. So that's, that's pretty much irrelevant to me. Uh, as far as the, the numbers, yeah, it's concerning, but I, I, I think um, a metric of some sort would help prevent and help uh, reduce that for sure because you'd have a, a set plan and I think people need to know as soon as possible what that plan is because it will reduce the anxiety that people are feeling of are, are we the, the common perception is that we're going to be in this all year that we're going to be fully virtual all year and I, I hope that's not true but I, I don't know and I can't say that that's not true right now because there's no metrics that have been adopted so I, I really don't know so I think as soon as you guys can act the better the community the students Everybody needs answers. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Noah. So right now, the the two pieces of feedback that I've heard have been to to push this back to next Monday and meet again and just talk about gating criteria. Does anybody have any thoughts outside of that idea? Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I I mean. No, everything that you said and everything that everyone said is true. Nobody wants to kick this any further down the road. We all need answers, right? I think we all agree on that. Um, I would be willing to wait a week just because I think it would be confusing if we pass something and then the county came back and then we changed it and we came back again next week. It would be like just, it would just be cause additional turmoil. I'm, I would be fine waiting until next week on Monday re and having another meeting, but I would not want to wait any longer than that. I would want us to take a vote by Monday, regardless of where the county is. One thing I just want to point out is that we, uh, and Noah, you said that we haven't adopted any metrics. We did adopt metrics um, on August 3rd with the best information that we had at the time. Um, 
we recognize that that's not the best, but, and that's what we're working to do. But we, we did adopt a 5% metric, which by the way, we're nowhere near that original metric. Yeah. Go ahead, Brenda. Yeah, and I also just like to point out that it's, we, we may, I mean, if we adapt metrics next week, we still don't know what's going to happen moving forward because the, the metrics rely upon numbers that we don't have any control over in terms of case burden rate and, and stuff like that. So um, I think it's great to have metrics. It gives people an idea of when we're willing to have kids back in school. But um, at the end of the day, those metrics are in the hands of um, our community. Okay, unless anybody else has any other comments specific to metrics, uh, go ahead, Don. So I'm looking at, Steve, I'm looking at your spreadsheet and you have the WIDHS burden only. And so I, I'm looking at your three columns, right? We have the W, uh, the Wisconsin DHS burden only, we have Andrews, and then we have the incomplete Brown County. Um, if we would get to next week and Brown County has not provided us with metrics. Would we be looking at those two models? So uh, if you look at the slide deck, remember the last slide on the slide deck actually shows the draft of that DHS plan, which carries both burden yep. and percentage and trajectory. Um, in order to try to do an apples to apples comparison, uh, Andrew's uh, proposal was burden only. Um, so I pulled the burden level out of that DHS model so that you could just simply look at those two side by side. Um, I think that uh, the board could consider whatever plan the board feels is appropriate. Um, you could look at burden only under the DHS metric, or you could go back and look at um, the DHS, DHS multi-metric with the three factors in there. Um, I think you could, you could look at either one of those. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, so the, actually there is, um, there is a, the, the motion, the motion that passed was for a first reading of the gating criteria that I presented and am amended during the meeting. So that's, that's the vote. I mean, unless someone wanted to amend it to, to something different. And again, that state, the state DHS criteria does not have any point for schools to be open normally. It does not have any point for schools to be blended. And it doesn't have any point for schools to be offsite. It's not made for schools. No, no one in DHS even said it's intended for for schools, so um, you you know it could <clears throat> yeah it it could be adopted, uh, but again if there you know I certainly wouldn't be able to vote for something if if the DHS criteria of law was necessary for schools to have normal operations because we will never get there and that it's too it's it's too it's it's just too restrictive. And I know some people will probably not vote for uh, numbers that I propose because they're too permissive, just like some people wouldn't vote for Harvard, Harvard Global Health as the standard because it is even more permissive than what um, I suggested, so. Can I just ask for a point of clarification, Eric? Yeah. And Andrew, it, it, I didn't hear this discussion start out with a motion like we normally do for action items. So is there a motion on the floor right now? I don't recall us tabling a motion from the last board meeting. It was right in, well, in the motion itself, it said that it would be brought forward to September 14th. But but it, doesn't that require someone to make the motion at the September 14th board meeting? No, I suppose we could. I think tra traditionally we've sometimes discussed for a while before before moving it. Oh, okay, I just want to make sure that there's not currently a motion on the floor that 
we're we're moving to approve right now. Correct. I would assume someone's probably going to move to to table it for uh, one additional week. So that that would be my question, Melissa. Is do we um, we're not posted for action? Do we need a motion to uh, table this to next Monday, the twenty first, or can we just do that? Well, so so going back to what we did at the last board meeting, I don't I don't think the motion was to table. The motion was that we would have. You were approving what a motion would be, but I, I do think at this meeting you're required then to make that that motion, which we haven't done, and you can't table a motion that hasn't been made. So I'm I'm not sure where we are because no one's made a motion and there's no motion to table right now. Yeah, so I'll I'll be the first one to say that I've got a lot of work to do in, in understanding Robert's rules. Uh, so if, if we're out of order here, I apologize for that. Uh, Noah, you're my go-to when it comes to Robert's rules. So if you can help me out here, I'd gladly appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this is an incident. You could postpone a motion that's on an agenda that hasn't been made but it's an incidental main motion rather than uh, a, a regular main motion, which means there's a couple procedural votes you guys would never take anyway that you can't make on a motion to postpone a non-pending motion. But if it's on an agenda, which you guys just adopt by unanimous consent, you can postpone something that hasn't been moved. If you don't like that procedure, and you don't like the incidental main motion, someone can just move for second reading and then immediately move to postpone for a week. That's also legitimate if you'd like. Melissa, do you have any uh, guidance on where you think we should proceed? I mean, I can move it and someone can move to postpone it if that seems cleaner for folks, that's fine. Are we finished with discussion? No, just trying to okay. figure out how to proceed. Well, I'm okay. just trying to figure out procedurally where we are. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's fine. I just wanted to make sure everyone understands there's no motion on the floor right now. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that guidance. And Noah, thank you for your feedback there. I've also uh, been contacted by a few people in our community and so working on uh, getting this to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, so with that being said, trying to figure out how to move forward, does anybody have any other comments uh, if we look to move this forward? Um, Go ahead, Rhonda. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if, I'm assuming that if the county doesn't come out with any criteria that we will then seriously consider our proposal. Um, if they come out with criteria are we able to have someone from Brown County Health come and basically discuss, explain, um, inform, empower our community? I think this is a perfect opportunity to do that. I don't know if they would be interested, but I can't imagine what would be in our best interest to try to explain the, the county's decision making. Of, they would do it the best themselves. So are we, able to maybe have them come forward during a meeting with us? We can certainly ask. We can make that request, absolutely. Okay. I, I think it would be important. Um, it would be really great also to be able to have questions, you know, asked and answered at that time as well. Um, otherwise, it just feels like we're just all kind of volleying around something that nobody wants to commit to for reasons I have no idea. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with you there, Rhonda. I mean, I, I think what I recall from our, our last meeting, uh, you know, Andrew came forward with this other proposal and sort of the feedback was, we would just like some, some feedback from somebody in the public health arena. I mean, as seven elected board members uh, with very little background and experience, uh, save for, for Dr. Warren, uh, we were looking for some other, someone to comment on that. And it feels like two weeks later, we're still in that same boat. Someone please comment, uh, give us some opinion um, so that we don't feel like um, we're shooting from the hip and, and 
it feels like we're still waiting from that, which is, is infuriating, I think, for all of us. I think we've actually had a few um, people from the medical community comment during our public listening session. I mean, there have been people that have given some feedback for sure. Um, so it would be nice- Not, on, not on Andrew's plan specifically. No, right? not on Andrew's plans, but we have had other feedback the entire time, I guess, is just to make sure that that's clear, we have. Um, so I'm, I'm just hoping that we can have, if we don't move forward with the plan, the proposal that's on the table, that we can get someone from Brown County Health to come and, and be visible and, and answer and you know, inform us and the community that will be watching, I'm sure. Sure. Go ahead, Christina. Now, I just say, if that doesn't happen on Monday, we still need to vote and determine what the plan is in a week, right? So we give that opportunity. We see what they say. To your point, Rhonda, we had, yes, we had people from the health systems look and give us feedback, but to Eric, your point, not on the gating criteria specifically to give us a review on that. So again, I think we wait a week. We, it gives us six more days. If we don't get anything, we figure out where we're going to go. And I, if I could just offer one point of clarification, I know, uh, Andrew, you were talking about the, uh, the DHS plan. The title for the plan is actually Interim COVID-19 Decision Framework for Schools. So um, their intentionality with that uh, framework that uh, is included in the PowerPoint was actually to use this specifically as a decision framework for schools. So did they, did they say at what point you should be fully open and at what point Hybrid? Now, it's my understanding that the framework went to the uh, governor's office where it died a quick, untimely political death before that was actually applied to it. Okay, so that's on the, on the one hand, it's, it's unfortunate. On the other hand, if it was if, if it was destined to create a system where no kids would have any chance at getting back to school in person ever, then maybe it was fortunate. I guess the, the bigger problem is that there isn't a robust discussion keeping the science in the forefront and it is being shuffled around politically. That, of course, is, is disappointing. Go ahead, Rhonda. Um, I don't see anything positive about that. As long as there is nothing there's no stake in the ground. No one's willing to actually take a position. People will swirl and swirl with uncertainty and frustration. I mean, so it's, it's just really, it's, I know we're not gonna do that tonight, but when I, when I hear the state just basically, you know, phone it in, um, it's very frustrating. They're supposed yeah. to be leading on this. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that that's sort of the, the overall where we're at. I, I don't think there's anyone who sits here and doesn't feel that way. And certainly a lot of people in our community who don't feel that way. I just want to remember that we did put a stake in the ground. When we made the motion, we attempted to do what we felt like was best at the time. What we're struggling with now is to say, okay, when we put that stake in the ground, we know more now and we need to put a better stake in the ground. So it's not like we've gone into this, uh, you know, with our head in the sand, we, we, we attempted to do that with the motion that was made on August 3rd. And what we're trying to do now is to be better than that. And um, so. But we're still letting the people who like to live in the gray area basically lead the discussion and keep us in limbo. And yep. it's yeah, just very yeah, yeah no, no disagreements for me there. That That's, that's, that's the frustration here. So are, are we okay if we just, uh, we're going to post another meeting, this is tabled for now, and we'll, we'll discuss this um, next Monday. I, I think, I, I think we have to, we have to, move, we have to either make the motion and move to table it or make a motion to table the scheduled motion to next week. All right, does somebody want to make a motion to table the gating criteria for September 21st? I have a question about that though, the motion. Okay. Are we able are we able to actually put some language in the motion that I guess makes us or 
it doesn't allow us to punt again that we actually have to take a vote. Is there anything that we can add in there that's a little bit more definitive about that? You can force the board to take an action. Um, but I think that uh, it's more of a collective will question. I defer to Melissa on that, but uh, I don't think there's a, I think you can obligate future boards to specific actions. I guess, that, can I be clear about what I'm saying though? I'm not saying it like I wanna force people to take a vote. I want to make sure that when people read that, it's very clear that we are, we are committed to making a decision. That's the language that I'm interested in making sure is in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's just to commit to act. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so looking for someone to make a motion to table the gating criteria to September 21st. Actually, if I could just step in, I think maybe to Rhonda's point, I think maybe what you want to do is you want to, uh, and Melissa jump in here, but you actually want to uh, make a motion that the board have a special meeting next week to take action, right? Because Rhonda, you want to obligate action. My, that would be my recommendation for the best way for you to obligate action is for the board to, to make a motion to have a special meeting next week to take action to set the eating criteria. Whatever we can do to make sure it's very clear to ourselves as well as the community that we are committed to doing that. So Melissa, I'd ask you, is that, is that the most definitive statement that the board can make to obligate at least a vote on it next week? So I think that goes back to, uh, that goes back to my point before. My, my concern is the, the motion that was attached in the agenda is the, the one that Andrew had made. So I think for purposes of complying with our open meetings, postings, and that the safest thing would be to table the motion until September 21st for purposes of taking action on September 21st. And then the, po the posting that we will do then is for action on this particular motion. So that will go to Rhonda's point based on the posting for the September 21st meeting. Well, can I ask another clarifying question then? Because I think what I'm hearing from the board is an intent to take action. And if it's posted that way, then the only action that the board could take would be to approve or disapprove that particular motion and if that's the case and that motion is not approved, then there's no motion to approve. And so my suggestion was to make a motion to have a special meeting um, at which uh, the board would take action to approve gating criteria. That way there could be multiple motions on the table so that there could be more than one set of gating criteria considered because otherwise we could get to next week and this motion could be voted down with no uh, alternate motion to be approved and therefore we finish next week with no uh, gating criteria. We don't need a motion tonight though, Steve, to do that. We can do that, um, the president and vice president and setting the board agenda can do that without having that in tonight's meeting. So really yeah, I, for, for purposes of this particular agenda item, we just need this particular agenda item tabled for next, for, until next Monday. And then Andrew, I'm sorry, then Eric and Christina can then set the agenda for the September 21st meeting to include that particular item that you're addressing. So I, just, I, don't, I don't know that I want to create the precedent, though, although clearly I have no doubt that this is what would be placed on the agenda, it's not about Eric or Christina. I, I don't think I want to create a precedent that we can have a motion with a, 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 a binding vote date on it that we informally scheduled to another meeting. I think we need to, I think we need to, because the motion as written requires it to be acted, uh, requires it to come forward tonight. I, I'm okay with either method of just making a motion to postpone the August 31st motion until the tw a special board meeting on the 21st or I can move the second reading and then someone can do that, but I don't think it can be handled in, can or should be handled informally.
Andrew? So I'm in a little, I'm in a little I, bit of loss here. It feels like yeah. we're spinning our wheels and there's a lot of people watching and a lot of other important questions to ask. So Can I ask a question um, about what yes. he just said? Yes. Andrew, what is wrong with what Melissa talk, I mean, spoke to? What, what, I guess I'm, I want to know what you're thinking about that. Well, the, the idea that, and maybe I just misunderstood it, but would we just be having like a general consensus understanding that this is going to be there next week? Or do you mean we would vote to postpone the August 31st motion to next week? But then, yeah, and then I, I think this motion is, is primary, but if we're posted for gating criteria, we should people should be able to make amendments and so forth which could be an amendment to replace it with the county's criteria. But can't you basically do that at, at the special board meeting or not? Yeah, I, I, think, you, I think you can. So okay. I, guess, yeah, I just misunderstood something. So okay. I, will, I will move to postpone the August 31st motion to a special board meeting to be held on the 21st of September, 2020 for the purpose, um, for the purpose of action on that motion. Second. All right, Beth. Shelton. Aye. Smith. Aye. Warren. Aye. Vanden Hubel. Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Motion passed 7 0. All right. Um, on the topic of reopening schools, Steve, I don't know if there's anything else that you wanted to share. It sounds like there may be a few questions uh, from board members. Um, Steve has said that he'll, he'll try to answer any questions specifically that you have. Obviously, we're not posted for any action on any of those topics. Uh, if he can't get you that information, he will certainly follow up uh, after the meeting, but is willing to, to hear questions. So any other questions about school? I know, Andrew, you said you had a couple. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, hope, I, I, I hope I'm not the only one. This is a big topic with a lot going on. We have things we heard just today from a public um, very concerning comments from the general public. So um, I will I will start with a, a couple of them. Um, where are we at in the process of identifying where there might be kids who have nowhere safe to go during virtual and or hybrid learning? I don't think that we're doing any specific analysis on students' home life at this time, if that's the question. I can check with the team on that, but I'm not aware of any assessment that we're doing um, to determine whether or not students' homes are safe. No, that, that isn't something specific that we're looking into. I, I guess I would need more information from Andrew, what, what he's asking about. Well, when I was kind of, when, when my concerns were um, deferred about what are we going to do about kids who, and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about common, commenting on individual people's home lives. I guess I'm just, um, I would consider it not having a safe place to go if for example, if kids under a certain very young age don't have a place to be with an adult in it during virtual learning. And I know some people are working things out, some people are working from, you know, working from home, but, you know, I thought one, one thing that, that came up, and this is why I get a little concerned when it's, you know, hey, Andrew, why don't you just, why don't you just back off a little bit and we'll let um, 
let people do what they do and, and ask the right questions and work on this behind the scenes, I, I thought there was some talk about, you know, let's rather than, right, because we didn't want to survey, we didn't want to ask who will, how serious of a problem will, will uh, off-site learning create for you and your family, right? And I thought instead there would be things like um, principals informally checking around and waiting to see if the community uh, community options were um, adequate, if they had enough slots, if they were accessible enough, right? So I, I guess I was hoping by now that there would have been some of those um, some of those discussions. I, um, you know, when I was, um, I was not permitted to continue with questioning last meeting about, um, I thought we were gonna maybe talk about things like maybe, and maybe the answer has changed. Maybe the COVID is too high right now, even for this, but are there certain groups of particularly high need kids where we could have them in the building, some or uh, some or all of the schedule, understanding that it would be a very small percentage of the building that would be attending. So my contention was I, I thought we would have thousands of kids in a situation where there is no appropriate safe place for them to be because of parents working and parents ha or parents having to decide to quit their job because of uh, because schools um, are not open for in to in person. And I'd love to hear that I'm wrong, but are we even are we even looking into this? I can offer that I know that the principals are working with individual families uh, to get them connected with assistance uh, outside of the school uh, through our community partners. So I know that the, the individual building principals to that extent, uh, and I'd, I'd say it's actually more than just informal, um, I would say that the, there's actually, uh, they've systemically looked at their student population um, with the goal of connecting them to community resources. So I would offer that that, that has uh, definitely taken place. Okay, good. So do community resources meet all the needs adequately? And then we can, we can say Becker was wrong and we only, we are in a fortunate position where only 900 kids or whatever needed, um, really needed those community supports and everyone else is in a safe, safe situation and Becker can shut up and we can move on because I'd be thrilled Oh, I'd be surprised, but I would be, if, if that number of slots, if my community partners with subsidized options took care of it, that, that'd be great. I can quit worrying about it, but it seems like you know, we're just pretty big for 900 slots to take care of it. Andrew, my, the one thing that I would just say to that, you know, certainly this, this situation, the pandemic and, and having to be virtual is creating some of that need, but there is never a time in our district where every single student is in a safe situation. Um, and certainly that number could be amplified, but we've created 900 more seats to address that. Um, but, you know, when we met a year ago before this pandemic started, there were students who are sometimes in unsafe situations and there's no way to capture that. We can't go knock on doors or do send out a survey to ask, is your kid always in a safe situation? So I don't know how we would, you know, we're, we're making our principals available. We could ask for some anecdotal feedback in terms of, you know, from our administrators. What have those conversations been like? Are there families that they've had to say, tough luck, we don't have anything for you? Um, you know, but outside of that, again, I, I was sort of the champion that I didn't feel like a survey would get us the, the information we looked for. And, you know, we've created 900 seats and uh, that, that's, you know, an unfortunate part of, of where we are. We all know that we've heard from families that are in difficult situations um, and, and we're trying our best to put together as many resources as we can. So I don't know what we would ask uh, the cabinet members to do in order to, you know, outside of uh, 
you know, going door to door to, to check on individual situations. Go ahead, Christina. I hear what you're saying, Eric. I do think though that as we're moving into September and looking into October and the rates are not going down and we're trying to figure out getting criteria that it would be good for our team to think about um, making sure that we're capturing additional needs as the school district is going on. So, you know, whether that means a survey or talking with Vicki and social workers, but I think there are some common sense solutions and strategies that we could employ that could gather some of that data so we would at least have a better sense of, you know, our, this is what we've done. Is it enough? Is it meeting the need? What additional strategies do we need to implement? Um, again, I, I don't know if it needs to be a full-on survey, but I think we could we could leverage some of the contacts. We, you and I have talked about principals, social workers, counselors. Um, so maybe we could talk about that in our meeting and come up with some strategies. Yeah, I mean, it feels very much to me like, you know, uh, for instance, tonight we're going to talk about food service. Uh, uh, Rhonda and, and certainly a lot of other people reached out and said, hey, I'd like an update. Where are we with this? What's going on? And now tonight, Lynette is here and going to provide us an update on food service. What it feels like to me, based upon what Andrew said, and it's been on all of our minds, is, hey, can we get counselors, social workers, administrators, can we put a group of that together to come and present to us and just tell us what they're seeing, what are they hearing? Uh, you know, certainly not gonna be all encompassing for our district, but uh, give us some, some feedback on what's happening at the ground level. I think that's what Andrew is interested in. Um, right. I, I think something that we can ask Steve to put on a future agenda mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. And perhaps those folks can also inform what they need moving forward, information yeah. they're missing, yep. right? This is, what, yep. this is what they need to gather because that's ultimately going to be the top of the line for them in their profession. Correct. Go ahead, Rhonda. Um, so this touches on that, but also something else, and I'm going to try to weave it in so that I can actually talk about it and it's actually allowed. When it comes to a survey and we talk about needs and wanting to know where people are, right? We want to meet them where they are. Is there any reason, and I keep thinking about this, why we wouldn't finish that survey that we had sent out maybe a week to 10 days prior to the vote, the initial vote on the plan, we were asking families who is interested in, in offsite virtual only. Because I think at that point, we might actually get some idea of, I can imagine that there would be families who may not be honest about what's going on in their homes because that's just reality, right? Sometimes it's a very difficult thing to, to admit to, um, but we need, the kids need us to, to know the, these things. So would it be possible, and if we are ever interested in moving towards a blended option or in-person option, don't we have to know the numbers of people who legitimately are not interested in coming into the buildings, right? Then we know what we're working with. If we, if we know the numbers of people who are absolutely not interested in coming into buildings and they want to stay virtual versus families who are interested in coming in, and, and maybe there are some reasons, some safety reasons, some protective reasons for why they would want to do that. I'm really interested in having that data personally to work with. I don't know how we plan when we don't know that. How do we plan blended if we don't know those numbers to begin with, it would make it a lot easier, I believe, if we actually knew who was committed to being home and is not interested in coming in. So just to kind of prompt that, pitch that idea. Rhonda, for, that, for me. That, oh, go ahead, Steve. I was just saying, that's a great point. We actually uh, had the internal discussion that uh, as soon as new gating criteria were passed, that we would uh, use that as an educational process, reach out to parents, explain the new gating criteria and say, given this information, uh, what would be your preference moving forward? Because uh, we need to know, to your point, how many people are going to elect to choose virtual with the idea that they would have an on-ramp then at the beginning of each quarter, or each semester, uh, and we would need to be able to plan for that, make sure we have enough instructors allocated to the virtual program uh, and prepare for any transition that would happen when we would go to blended. 
Um, so that is exactly, that is a, a great point and that's exactly what we wanna do. We were just waiting to we had the great gating criteria so we could use that um, as an opportunity to make sure we got an accurate feedback from them. And then wouldn't it be possible if they wanted to add some comments? We can put a, there's no, no reason we can't put a free response section right? in the survey. And maybe yeah. they, they let us know that they are sometimes making very difficult decisions about going to work versus certainly being home safety in mind. Yep. Sorry, Eric, I interrupted you there. No, I, I was going to say the exact same thing that, that uh, parents are going to need more information because you know to, to ask a question about a hypothetical uh, would be tough to answer. So. All right, um, Andrew, did you have other questions? Um, yeah, if um, no one else does, uh, we heard at we heard at public forum a concern about um, how much how much time is spent with just um, just the on screen instruction model and the age appropriateness of of that. And I, and again, this is where, you know, we had, I remember certain things from discussions, but the board didn't set, um, didn't set parameters. Um, I, I'm hearing, I, I've heard from no people that said that there is not enough. Um, connection through through the screen. I, I have heard some cases where people have said balance is good between on screen time and off screen activities and coming back, which I imagine uh, probably works better as the ages get older to an extent. But um, you know, where are we with that? And are, are we expecting kids to just um, to just watch the the Chromebook for for seven hours, even at a even at a very young age, because if if we are, I think maybe we should change some rules and expectations. But if if we're not, maybe I'm just hearing some anecdotal cases. But I remember specifically that both synchronous and asynchronous instruction were supposed to be part of how we were doing this. So could I get some clarification? So that is indeed the case and, and uh, our academic support team uh, put together uh, some frameworks for uh, schools and the teachers to use. Uh, that was a big part of the professional development process. Uh, I, I can share with you that having been in uh, some online classes and being physically present in some uh, teachers classrooms while teaching, I see that balance. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the dashboards that uh, schools or individual teachers have created, you see that balance. Uh, so uh, I think that one of the things that's important to recognize is you know, we've got thousands of classrooms out there and there's likely some variance in the uh, implementation. Uh, and, and to the extent possible, when we find that, that's an opportunity for us to make sure that we work with uh, our uh, leadership teams and our building principals um, to make sure that that balance is present. Uh, you know, I spent the entire day in front of a screen today. It makes me pretty exhausted when I'm here at the board meeting. Um, it's not good for adults. It's probably not good for kids. Um, and so that was part of our process in terms of, of trying to make sure that we created um, both uh, connection time, uh, but also, uh, as you mentioned, that asynchronous time, those off-screen assignments. So uh, that was a big part of the work that the academic support team did and part of the, the templates that they built for teachers as they develop their uh, class day. Um, so if that's not, uh, if that we find that that's not happening, uh, that's really a teachable moment for us as we're working with our staff to make sure that they're working with their building principal and their leadership team to appropriately structure their day. I think if you're seeing that in some cases with the, you know, with the youngest kids, um, as you know, if there's something that, if there's something that's happened that I'm upset or angry about, I'm not shy, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, this is not necessarily one of those times. I think there's, you could have a situation where uh, a teacher is 
intentionally trying to do something for all kids on screen at the same time all day because they believe it's the best way to maintain contact with all the kids at the same time and your heart would definitely be in the right place there no no doubt but there is a bit of a less is more and by having kids away from the screen for you know, uh, decent chunks of time, they're getting more, you know, when they're there. And I've heard some good things about how, you know, I've um, occasionally, uh, usually I'm, you know, busy doing my own uh, working from home, but I've, I've checked in, I've seen times where there was whole group instruction and also where there was waiting period and there was gonna be a small group, small group check-in. So I think we'll get there. Uh, but we need to we need to be responding to people in the community who are saying, you know, it's not good for people to have only the on the on screen model all day. And obviously, people are saying that they're getting that. And if if those are the only voices out there, you know, oh, okay, can believe what they're doing in Green Bay? The kids are being yelled at to sit down and watch the the screen. Uh, despite the fact that, you know, I think time will tell that we were the district that was forward about needing to have um, off-site instruction and um, other districts may find themselves in that situation through circumstance anyways. Um, I wish, you know, wish them the best on that too. And uh, I'm crossing one thing off of, uh, I'll, I'll stop. I have one thing and I'm gonna cross the last thing off my list and I'll ask the question through email. But I, I have one more, but I saw there were other hands so I can back off. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention, Andrew, that I think what you bring up is really important. I think it's a learning growth opportunity for all of us. Like I know my son who is nine, um, you know, there's been a tremendous improvement in the past week for him of synchronous versus asynchronous, having that time away from the screen. Um, and so I, what I've been doing is encouraging parents and people who are feeling like it's either too much or too little to reach out directly to the teachers and principals so that they can give that feedback. But, um, but I have been really proud of the work, at least the teachers that my kids have of finding that good balance. And I think it's just gonna be a work in progress because we know that no matter what, that virtual learning is never gonna replace in-person learning. So just, I just wanted to share that with what I'm seeing as having an elementary kid at home every day um, as a parent. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with you there, Christina, and just seeing my kids evolve. I think it's also been easier for you know, educators as we've gone on. You know, the first couple of weeks are, are building culture, and so it is everyone on the screen, the entire class. But, you know, both of my kids had small group times where they're on for 15 minutes and then they're off. Uh, my biggest challenge is when my kids are off for a break is, is finding a time to get them back on at the right time so they don't think they're done for the day at 1130 which they've tried to con me into. So uh, go ahead, Rhonda. Um, you might've mentioned this Steve, but I'm not sure. I'm just gonna ask again. Um, what's the checks and balances to make sure the kids are not on all day? So our uh, building principals are working with the leadership teams at the buildings. Uh, and that's part of that monitoring process uh, that they work with collectively. Uh, and uh, our academic support team has worked on um, scope and sequence and pacing work to make sure that, uh, uh, that there is an appropriate balance there. Um, so that's uh, from a building supervision standpoint, that's one of the things that our principals do um, is monitor those classrooms to make sure that there is that balance. Um, are we interested or is there an opportunity in the next maybe, you know, September, maybe by November, December? Are we going to check back in and just find out how parents are doing? Because while maybe some kids are getting better at this, we have to make sure we're not actually creating any harm by it. Um, yeah, we can I'm certainly do that. I'm, I'm interested to make sure that there aren't unintended consequences. You know, we follow the science for one thing and then we kind of don't really follow it when it comes to screen time. And I think it's important to, to stay on top of that. 
to every single point that Andrew has made. Andrew, did you have one more question to ask? I wanted to know where um, where things were at for and how it's being processed as far as um, are people are people submitting applications to bring kids on site for specific um, projects or work that requires on site? Um, are they getting to the approval process? Are they on hold at current COVID levels? I mean, there are, the smaller the thing gets and the more space there is, I would think you could do just about every, there's many things that could be done um, hopefully with safe spacing and social distancing, even though the cases are are high, but wanted to hear where things are going with that and if some of those are happening. I see that Vicki's live again, so I'll, I'll have her jump in here, but uh, I know that uh, in uh, the last time that I checked in on this, the only request that had not been granted at that time uh, were ones that had to go back and have their um, safety protocol revised so that it would comply with expectations when they were in the building. Um, other than that, all of those whose protocols had uh, complied had been accepted. So Vicki, I, I see you're live if you've got uh, more information ahead. Yeah, I was just adding the, the total that we've approved thus far. Um, I think we're close to 15, Mr. Becker. Um, there are a few that we did say no to at this time because we want to focus on academic and credit bearing activities. Um, but the rest have all been approved. Uh, it looks like we have about 15 right now spread out across the district. Okay, Could I, can you give some, like some general, I mean, are these like some, like some lab science stuff or some? Yeah, um, bridges construction so that they can go to their offsite locations, city stadium, automotive, um, GED, the bilingual program, uh, GED students being able to come on site to take their test, which has to be proctored face to face. Um, I know we want to get away from the, the at-risk language, so at promise students meeting individually or in small groups with social workers or teachers. Um, internships, apprenticeships, um, again some at promise work at the elementary level, small group individual. Have you had like submissions for lab science classes yet? Um, Agri Science at Southwest, and uh, there was a question whether Preble and East might need that as well. So I need to email out to those schools. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, with that being said, Steve, I think you can keep going through your report. All right. Uh, our next uh, item on the report is summer school. And uh, Lisa Johnson has joined us. Her report is attached to it. Uh, and she's going to share an update with you on uh, outcomes from summer school. Lisa? All right. Thank you very much. Oh, and Josh already took over the screen. Thank you, Josh. All right, so we're going to um, talk a little bit about summer school. Obviously, this past summer was a unique summer school experience for all of us as we go through. Josh, go ahead, you can go ahead. So a little bit of background um, with summer school itself. So um, during the pandemic time frame from March on, which March is typically the time where we do summer school enrollment, um, Act 185 was put in place, and Act 185 um, has really talked about the fact that school districts would not receive their report cards, but instead we have to report out as a school district on certain things that we did. Summer school is a component of what we will be reporting out on of things that we did for learning over that time frame for our students. 
In addition, over that time frame, um, the state also enacted an emergency rule for PI-17, which is the state statute that really talks about allowing virtual education for schools. Typically in a summer school, we are only allowed to offer virtual education for high school credit bearing courses for summer school. But this summer that was um, changed to allow for all grade levels to offer a virtual education experience for kids. So the purpose really for summer school as we really looked at it this summer, it was, it was a little bit different than in the past. We really looked at what do we need right now for our students and our student learning's purpose was really around the social, emotional and academic focus and continuous learning from the school year. We knew that there was a lot of kids that had some, um, some continued learning needs that needed to be focused on over the summer time frame. We also looked at process goals for, uh, as an organization. We knew going into the pandemic that there were things that um, we needed to continue working on and that there could be a potential for us to be in a virtual environment in the fall. So one of the things that we looked at was really providing professional learning for our teachers to focus on best practices for online learning with the goal really to analyze that data to inform revisions and preparing for the future um, district-wide professional learning if we were to be in a virtual environment, which that turned out to be true um, as we looked at that. We also looked at our feedback from parents um, that we got in the springtime. And one of the things that we really noticed is that we needed to look at one platform for virtual learning for our elementary. Secondary had a single platform, but elementary did not. So we really needed to look at that um, as an organization and use summer school to help us determine where that future was going to go. Go ahead, Josh. Thank you. So summer school, when we're talking about summer school today, just for clarification, because this is a little bit unique, there also, we have summer school, and then we also have special education has extended school year services. Um, that is offered in the summer school. And that maps face-to-face. -face. What we're gonna be talking about today is just summer school, not ESY. So summer school for 2020, um, it did start late um, due to COVID-19. Typically we start summer school in June. We did move it back to July to give us some time to really put all these different components in place. Um, as we went through this year um, with, with summer because we had a lot, of, a lot of components to look at with PD for our teaching staff. You can advance, Josh. Thank you. So in terms of student participation data, a few kind of highlighted areas that we had from the summer. Um, we had over 500 continuous progress and credit recovery enrollments for students. So these are students that maybe did not finish their course from spring and needed to finish up those courses to get then finish that credit um, for summer school. So we had a lot of those enrollments. We also had over 47 high school seniors that were able to, they were short on graduation credit, but over our summer school enrollment, were able to get enough credits to be able to graduate. So we had 47 kids meet that milestone in summer school so that they could they were able to get their diplomas. We had over 600 students at the high school level that were able to earn new coursework grades, new credits, and so those new credits typically in summer we focus on things like um, biome courses, um, health and science courses, personal financial literacy, those types of courses in summer school. So we had over 600 credits earned. We also had approximately 1,700 students in K-8 that focused on social, emotional, and academic learning opportunities in a virtual environment this past summer. So overall enrollments, I kind of gave you an overview here of where we were with enrollments. We knew by being virtual that that was going to have an impact on summer school this past year. We also knew that the sports academy, typically we have about 1,400 kids in the sports academy and without having the sports academy in a face-to-face, -face, um, that also decreased some of our enrollments. 
You will also notice in, the, in these numbers, while we had middle school mentors and freshmen forward, we did not include them in here because it was a little bit different this year, obviously being going into a virtual environment. So we also did not include those. So overall, when you take those out, we were down about 1,200 students. Um, if you were to take those component pieces out of what we typically would have from an overall enrollment. Go ahead. So our teacher professional development for summer school, we really looked at that and we spent a lot of time, we focused and worked a lot with teaching and learning um, and our tech integrators on summer school PD this past summer. We really looked at the specific platforms, spent a lot of time with CISA onboarding that for our elementary teachers. We looked at best practices for virtual learning and then the social emotional component as well within there. And how do we help our teachers to become better teachers in a virtual environment in summer in summer? And those, those folks spent a lot of time with all of that. So we did is we pulled out some teacher feedback. We focused a lot on elementary based upon our surveys from the spring and what we needed to do with our teachers and the platforms. So here you have, we have some teacher feedback. Um, so kind of, a, kind of going through the high level, um, I felt satisfied with the preparation for teaching a summer school. So you'll see about 64% of our, our teachers were either positive or neutral that they felt that, that it was a really good, positive thing. Then on the second, next question, it talks about I had the opportunity to teach summer school again. Would I teach it again? So was it a positive experience for them? And you will notice that over 80% of our teachers said that they would teach again um, if they were um, to teach in a virtual summer school. Um, I felt, so the teachers also felt that their competencies improved while teaching in summer school. Over 95% of our teachers with feedback felt that their competencies with technology improved um, during that time frame. And the, we also got feedback that said over 90% of them agreed that uh, they felt prepared to teach online in the fall because of summer school if we were teaching virtual in the fall. So we felt we had really good feedback on that, that this experience is with summer really helped them to feel more confident in teaching as we must go forward. And then we also talked a little bit and talked to them about their live sessions and how was their teach how were their students um, attending those live sessions? And you will see here from this data. Um, a large percentage of the kids were, t were attending over 50% or higher of those live sessions um, that were being offered by those teachers. Um, and those the kids were attending those during the summer school sessions. We also then talked to our parents at the elementary level and we said, how were things going from a parent perspective? Um, did the first question was the teacher communicates um, the teacher communication they received during summer school met their expectations. 93% of parents um, said that it either it was they met or were neutral with the expectations that that communication with families. Um, using the CSAP platform was simple though, uncomplicated for my child. So this one, again, over 85% of the families that responded said that they either agreed that it was either strongly, uh, um, it was, they strongly agreed, agreed or were neutral that, that CISA was uncomplicated and simple to use um, for their children um, in summer school. We also asked them about what best describes how your child felt during summer school. The top three responses, as you can see, were that their child felt either interested, happy, or excited about learning during the summer time frame. Um, so those were some of the top responses of that um, from our families. And then lastly, compared to spring, um, did summer school learning environment improve? So did, we, did they see an improvement in what that learning environment looked like? And over 86% um, felt that it was either neutral or that it had improved from the spring. 
So the work that we had done with the teachers, the parents were feeling that there was an improvement um, that was happening during that time frame. So in conclusion, what we really felt for summer school, kind of our takeaways this year from summer school, is summer school is an extension of the school year and provides an opportunity for two students to really complete unfinished learning, to take and do that continuous progress of learning. And we really focused on that this summer and we really spent a lot of time looking at how do we support those kids with that continuous learning progress. And we worked collaboratively with all of our interdepartment departments as a school district. So um, summer school also provides an opportunity to do that social, emotional, and academic learning experiences. We do know that being virtual, obviously there were experiences that we did not have this summer in terms of some sports academy, those types of things that obviously we know uh, moving forward are things that we would want to continue to um, include. Um, but it is a good, summer school does provide a lot of good learning experiences for our kids. We also learned, because this is the first time we really used summer school to, to look at teacher training. And we did learn a lot from that and said that really it can be used successfully as an environment to help train our teachers. And we've heard a lot of good positive things from our teachers that participated in summer as they have started now with this fall. And really you're seeing a lot of those teachers step up as those leaders um, this fall as we are working with a, a virtual environment. So as a, that's kind of a high level overview of where we are with, with this past year with summer. Any questions? Doesn't look like there's any questions, Lisa. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, actually, I just want to give a quick shout out because I think that uh, when I arrived on site in July, uh, I just want to say thanks to the crew. They were working super hard to figure out how to make summer school work. Uh, and they really uh, paved the way for some of the online uh, learning that we're doing today. Uh, both uh, the administrative team and the teachers that were I don't know if the right word is brave, but brave enough to, uh, to step in and give it a try, uh, really proved to be uh, wonderful role models for everybody else. So um, Lisa, thanks to you and everybody on that team for all the work you did. Thank you. So speaking to people that have uh, gone outside the box uh, to think of uh, other ways to serve our kids, uh, Lynette uh, and her team have done an absolute outstanding job uh, serving uh, hundreds of thousands of meals uh, to kids uh, since last March. Uh, and uh, her creativity didn't end there. Uh, she's been busy thinking about ways that we can uh, help our kids uh, over the course of the fall. So Lynette, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming today. Absolutely, thank you. So um, Josh, do you have anything to bring up on the board? I've got that PDF. I could show. Sure, so, that is fine. Okay. This one here. All right, perfect, thank you. So as all of you can see, the food service department, we have been very busy as um, Superintendent Murley has said, and I thank you for your kind words to our department. So from March 23rd through August 31st, we were able to feed to all of our students in Green Bay underneath um, the summer feeding, free meals to all students. So as you can see, we did feed 693,344 meals. And there was a letter that did go out to all regarding districts and how many meals that were served over with, through Wisconsin. And it was um, 31 million. And so we were a huge part of that piece of meals that were served. 
the meals that we are served through September, as you can see, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner meals, um, we are very proud because we are feeding our children. What I can say is we had to do a quick turnaround for Green Bay. We were not told until August 31st that we were able to feed our kids free. At 10.30 in the morning on August 31st, I was made aware that USA, what they did do is they put out a public release, a public release that was sent out to everyone. So what I did at 10.34 is I called the Department of Public Instruction, who was um, my consultant for our district. And when I talked to her, I asked her, does this mean I can move forward? Can I work on the public release? And Josh, if you wanna keep moving, you may. Um, so with that, I was told, no, you cannot. But what I did right away is I got in contact with Lori Blakely, who works with our public relations department. And um, I cannot thank her enough and her team with Kristen because what they have done and they got all the publication ready for an email, a text and a call out to all of our families just in case we got the red, um, excuse me, the green light on this. So as you can see, it does state that um, on August 31st, it was announced that all meals now were free. So we were very thrilled about this, but we had to get all of our communication out to all the families. Because also what we did do, and I did um, make sure that I did communicate this with all upper leadership with cabinet, that we did apply for all, late, all of our waivers that we could possibly apply for, for our food service department for, and for our community. So um, as, as I have stated in the beginning, and I will continue to state for the department, we are committed to feed our families in our um, community. We do have everything listed online of our locations and times on our website. We make sure that we have that in tags of all of our emails for all of our families. We will send this information out one-on-one -on -one when we work with families. We are still moving forward and feeding at Family Services. All of their meals are free now. Boys and Girls Club East and West, we are now feeding breakfast, lunch, and dinner to, uh, to those families. So we are increasing the number of meals that we served last year to what we are serving now because of the way USDA has approved us feeding. That includes the YMCA, the advocates that we um, feed where we do have students go. And we do um, have volunteers who right now are picking up meals and delivering meals. But we are also working as a district with implementing more volunteers within our community to start delivering more meals starting next week. We do also have families that are picking up meals for neighbors and friends. When I'm out at the site, and I know other of our managers that are out at the site, they are also communicating this to the families as they pick up. We have moved forward on purchasing two of our concession trailers so we can go to neighborhoods. When we do this, we are going to be in a location for 45 minutes tops. And the reason it's gonna be 45 minutes because we want to be able to go to many areas. We are looking for a, getting um, places approved. Some of the places we want to go to, they are private. So we have to make sure that they do approve them for our district to feed the students who um, have transport who do not have transportation and that are bust. I have also worked with transportation with um, James and with Chad 
and they have assisted with the numbers of students that are bused from these locations. So we also know the number of meals that we would feel comfortable with, com comfortable with having accessible for those students. So um, our revenue from September 1 through September 4th, and this is strictly reimbursements. This does not include any a la carte, does not include um, other funds that we would normally get. This is strictly reimbursements. And in the four days we served as each and or that served, but revenue will have come in is at $98,860. So with that being said, we are hopeful that our reimbursement will cover the cost to the district food service program. We do have some challenges moving forward because we want to make sure that we are getting food to all of our families. We want to make sure that we are communicating to all of our families, where do you go pick up the meal? We want to make sure there's a common, common understanding that meals are for all children ages 18 and under, and they're not just for the Green Bay Area Public School District. And we feel that our food service department is doing everything that we possibly can, but we are always, always open to any suggestions that anyone has brought, bring forward. Um, we know that social and emotionally, this is difficult for children and for families in our community. We understand that. But when I get an email that um, thanking the food service department from a parent of everything that we have been doing for their children in their household and other families in the community, that goes a long way. And um, I'm very proud of the team that it takes to put this together. So um, I'm not sure if there's any other questions or is there anything that I can assist with? Um, I do know that there has been some concern out on the uh, with the board or some um, other areas. So um, with some that has been brought forward, I just want to share with you again, that we are working with volunteers and we're gathering them so we can reach out to the families that are having um, some issues getting meals. Also, I want to share with you, we have signage. We have worked with a company here within Green Bay, Lori Blakesley, again, she has worked with us in creating the signs that, signage that we need out at the schools to let them know that we have grab and bowl meals. Also, we have a sign that we put out every day that says meals served now. So um, families can see it's something different that people will notice that. We did a video that all families can go out and look at the video to see what it looks like when you walk into a school area. We have um, taken in consideration social distancing we also have taken in consideration families may come without masks. We have masks provided. We have taken consideration um, just not letting a parent come up because those children may still be in the car and those children are with that family or with that parent or guardian. So they're in their cohort. So that's why they're all able to come together because we did not want to have any child left in a car by themselves. Um, again, we do want everything to be transparent. We don't want anyone to feel uneasy coming to get a meal. And we are doing our best as a district to make sure that we are reaching out to students and to families. Thank you. Lynette, I have a question. Uh, first, thank you for this robust update. I mean, it, it's it's information like this that you know just really goes into depth how how far we're going to try to meet those needs and those numbers are just astonishing. So thank you for all of your work. I'm wondering about how, um, in terms of usage at sites and how you um, 
know, try to prepare the number of meals and how many people are showing up every day and, and thinking about food waste and things of that nature? Are, are we running into situations where people are showing up and we're, we run out of food and, and how are you, how is your team adjusting to that? I'm sure it's a daily, a daily battle. Yes, I, um, I will tell you the first day was very interesting and it's, it was, it was a good day. And why I can say it was a good day, we, we were not prepared for all those meals because they, the number of meals that people wanted and that it was amazing. But the team that I have, it's, it's amazing because we are ready. We knew that we had to have a plan into place from our drivers to the food service team knowing who we have 50 meals we know we need more that they would be calling everyone was on board everyone was on key just ready to expedite and um it surpassed our numbers uh one school uh we did not ex even expect that we would reach the meals that we did and we were just astonished by the meals um, even times we're changing our serving times to adapt to the families. I have some food service employees that are working six o'clock at night because families reached out to a principal saying, it's not gonna really work for us to, re to pick the meals up during the day. Can we pick them up in the afternoon? So we're open at a school from two until six to adapt for these families and we're planning. So Eric, what that has done is meals that we have left over we are able to then dispatch those meals that we had left over during the day and get those out to those schools. It's amazing how we are able to turn those meals around and we are not having a loss of food. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Can't see all the hands. Um, Andrew, I see yours. There we go. I had, um, you touched on one of my questions. I, I would imagine there's, I would imagine there's more than just one, one school where parents work eight to five in the standard distribution. Um, most of them are between um, nine and three. So excellent that at that one site, um, Families talk, the principal realized it made the request and you made it happen. But what about other places? I'm assuming that, you know, there's, and in many cases, taking care of other ways, getting the word out that you can pick up for, um, you can pick up for neighbors and you can pick up for friends as long as we're picking up, um, you know, one per, per kid per day total. Um, so what a, what about is there more being planned there because I have to imagine it's happening in places where people didn't didn't speak up or or it's just better covered through informal methods than I thought but I think a lot of people will just not think of it and not not go and not even notice because by the on their way to work it's not open on the way back from work it's already closed thank you for that question what um, the times that the food service department is feeding is from nine o'clock in the morning until six o'clock at night. So with that being said, all students, all families can go to any location and get a meal. When, this, when USCA put out the new waiver on October, uh, excuse me, let me clarify that on August 31st, that we could feed the summer feeding program to continue feeding that way. Our students could go to any school to pick up a meal. So that would that means now we're, we are serving from 9 a.m. until 6. We are um, increasing our time of service. So I have not heard of any other issues um, from principals. There's one other principal who did reach out to me and ask me, could he change his serving time instead of nine o'clock in the morning until one, 
could we serve from 9.30 to 1.30? And I said, absolutely, we could do that. He just felt that would fit better for him. And again, the principals out at those schools, we are here to do a service for the principals. We are here to do the service for the families. And if there's a need or a want, we're gonna make sure that we are doing the best that we can. I am not gonna say that I'm always the most favorite person to all of the food service workers because of some of the decisions that you just have to make those hard decisions. But again, they're the decisions for the families. They're the decisions for the community. There's a reason why all of us are here. And the reason is all of those children in our schools. So, but is there, so is there only one place currently that meals are available till six? Yes, yes, Andrew, that is correct. So I think that's that's good, and the place you do it first is is where there's a request. But I would say are people most um, people who are most in need of the meals if they're on the opposite side of town from that location. It might be a case where we're offering it, but it's not realistically available. So I would. Uh, I think it might be a good idea to look into, you know, at least one place on each side of town. And also, I don't know, um, I don't know how well people know yet that you can go to any school. And even if, I'll, I'll just give another example, even though, um, even though I know that you can go to any school, I still wasn't sure if I should go to any school and I, st I stopped at a school that was um, directly on my way home but it's a, a smaller school now I asked and they said oh yeah we're, we're fine and I was towards the end of their pickup period um, I would imagine there's an sounds like though there's enough wiggle room there that that you should um, absent something really weird like 50 people deciding to go to John Dewey tomorrow instead of the school they went to the last eight days in a row, but chances are there should be enough wiggle room that it's fine, right? That is correct. That is okay. correct. And also I am going to, um, I do have a weekly communication with all of the, with all of the principals. So I am going to take your recommendation and I will put that information out to them to see if anyone um, has heard anything or if they would like to evaluate the times that we are serving. Because again, I want to make sure that we are serving and capturing um, what we need for the schools. So I will put that in there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Rhonda, I'm sorry. R Rhonda or Brenda, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm sorry, Rhonda, yep. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm not sure, Lynette, if you are the person I should ask this question to. If not, I'm. It might be someone else, but I just, I'll just go for it anyway. Um, what are we doing when, when there, when food has run out? Are we sending families? Um, to their schools, and I'm, I'm actually, let me be a little more clear. I'm thinking about students specifically. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how much time they are allowed to get, because we're not providing transportation, how much time are they allowed to get to the site to pick up? And is there any sort of variance in when it comes to a penalty for either leaving class early or maybe not making it back in time because of the time it took to get to get to the food? I cannot answer that full question. What I can answer if we run out of food, the food or the meal of the day, what we have in all of our kitchens, our backup meals, and those backup meals will consist of possibly a frozen pizza, pre-wrapped frozen pizza with um, pre-packaged fruit, vegetable, milk. So we always have those available and ready to go. It may not be the meal that is menued for the day, but we want to make sure, because we have history now, 
and also we want to make sure we're planning for the future that we have food available. I cannot answer your other question. I can jump in real quick and tell you that uh, I was actually just in a meeting uh, with our administrators, our building administrators, and they were emphatic that uh, uh, there is no penalty for leaving early or arriving late. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, several of the principals um, said that uh, I, I, they have actually told their parents that um, they can go pick up uh, meals at any point recognizing that there may be alternate locations than their home school that are preferred for meal pickup. Um, so they were all uh, emphatic about, uh, about that. Um, what if these are, so what if these are students whose parents are working and their, their parents are not home and not able to go pick up food? Um, what are we doing to reach out to students to ask them if they're in need of something to reconcile that? Because it's possible that they're not going to just tell us, right? Um, are we actually asking students about that? Well, um, I can touch base and I can try to clarify that a little bit more, is that our um, upper leadership has reached out also with the principals to our social workers, with the families that they do work with to see if there is a need and what is our need or how can we branch out to have more assistance for these families and i know that is happening within our district and also that we are reaching out with other branches for volunteers and starting the 21st is where we should have all of our, our volunteers more in place but i can personally tell you that i know this is happening because there is one family that I have worked with Superintendent Murley on and also with another school board member and Don and that I delivered meals to this family. And after that, I did contact and they were getting everything set within the school and the school did a wonderful job getting all this to happen. So mm -hmm. sometimes it just takes time to make sure that they're getting to all of the families that they need to get to. But I, I, I'm I, telling you one that I know of for sure because I was part of that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. Um, that sounds really good. I'm, I'm wondering though about students who maybe aren't working with a social worker. Maybe their parents are so preoccupied for various reasons that they're not in contact with anyone or maybe they've just, because of the pandemic, it's, it's kind of a new thing for them that they are, they're in need of some food mm -hmm. and they're not able to get into schools to have that satisfied. So uh, are we asking, are we able to ask students, not necessarily even their families, but are, are we able to, can teachers just somehow maybe even just touch base or check in to see if there are kids who are actually need some food and, and don't understand that they could maybe have it delivered even though their parents, they don't have a vehicle and their parents are, are both working. Actually, that has happened. Um, that there is a teacher at Weekbiak and she told me that that's what she was doing to her class. Mm -hmm. And then she was talking to the other teachers about that, that this is what she's doing. And I thought that was just a fabulous idea. So I want to, it was last week or possibly the week before that we did put it, as I said, I'm gonna put a communication out to the principals regarding the times and everything as per uh, Andrew's ask. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. Could you, um, to the principals, could you please ask or ask your teachers to just drop a little line to your uh, teachers to say to the students, oh, here's where you go so you can see okay. where they're serving at your school and you can go pick up a meal. So we have done that. We've touched that avenue. Okay. And that, and I, again, that's great. Um, I think it's good to extend that conversation too. And if you can't get there because your parents are working or you don't have a vehicle, we have options, especially when we start thinking about weather turning and not being so great. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, we're sending kids maybe out to get food and that's not obviously ideal. Um, I think just to really dig in and, and find out what we can do as far as getting, getting the food to them because they can't, you know, they can't leave and maybe they don't realize, are we communicating that they won't be penalized for leaving class early or maybe being late for class? Mm -hmm. Perfect. That, that's something that I think should be very clear because I, if they don't know that, they won't ask about it. Yes, I think that um, that's great. And I believe as Superintendent Murley did say that he, when he talked to the group earlier to let them know that there is no penalty, that mm -hmm. this is something that we do have an operations meeting and we could talk further on this how we could communicate this out as a district regarding no penalty and with food and everything. And um, we could really touch a lot of families. And possibly um, even Rhonda, when you were talking regarding students, we're sending emails out to families, but maybe we should also look at sending emails out to the students too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just another avenue also. So, um, you know, it's good to talk. It's good to have these um, networks because um, we learn and we can grow and get and I better. Think, and the, that's, the, that's the thing. Sometimes it, it's all discussed in this area, but it doesn't get down to the students themselves. And they're not empowered and they don't know that they can actually reach out about that. Yes, yes, great, thank you. Because I you. just thought about as we were talking, Thank you. Just an FYI, that's one of the things that uh, I, at the secondary schools, that's one of the purposes of our uh, Wednesday uh, homerooms for our students. Uh, and I know some of the secondary schools have already tackled that as an issue, but we can certainly share that with the rest of them to make sure that word gets out around them. I do have one more question about buses, and that's my last question. It was discussed at one point that we may consider going into neighborhoods with buses full of food. Is that off the table entirely? As of, as of right now, I'm not gonna say anything is off the table. Um, what we are doing is um, there are certain locations that we are looking at. I have to get approval that for, to go in there because they are, they're neighborhoods, but they're more of a neighborhood where it's kind of gated, if I could say, that I can't just go in there. Uh, so I'm waiting for approval. And also, as far as the busing in certain locations, I might be reaching those families of what you're talking, what you're discussing right now of taking the buses. Also, if we use the buses per se and go around and follow bus routes, I am concerned regarding the um, time and temperature and there's no coolers for the milk. I don't have any electricity. Um, I, I, I get very concerned with that. So that's another reason why we are waiting for our concession um, trailers. They mm -hmm. have electricity so we can plug in. The milk is being in a controlled temperature because again, we don't want to put anything out there or put anything in danger and that food in a potential danger zone and especially milk. And then it would come back that um, we are not having operable machinery. Um, just, I mean, there are other, other communities doing this with buses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Have you asked how they are handling the food temperature issues? I mean, are, are people able yeah. to just or well, what are I they doing about this? Absolutely. I could reach out. I could um, check and see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would just, if it's a cooler issue, I wonder, I mean, there are community members who, they just need to be told what we need sometimes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Remember that that's one of the reasons that uh, we're looking at those concession trailers because then we can provide that uh, fully climate controlled meal delivery process. So that was one of the rationales for uh, staying away from the buses and looking for something that 
uh, and would have more flexibility traveling on city streets and would have the appropriate uh, electric uh, hookups and, and uh, cooler capacity. And I, and I would say I was looking at it as an efficiency because I know that we aren't using our transportation budget right now, really. So if there would be a way to integrate that somehow would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Lynette? Thanks, Lynette. Very robust update. We really appreciate it. And everything that you and your team are doing, please pass along uh, our kind words. Absolutely. I appreciate it. All right. Next up on our uh, list is uh, um, our AGR report. Uh, and uh, lots of people obviously contribute to this, uh, which you can uh, likely tell from the length of the report. Uh, we've got several people here who uh, can take questions uh, on that, uh, although we may have to go back to the team as a whole to get uh, further clarification on it. Um, but uh, Vicki and I are both on the call. And I'm looking around, Nancy may be on, yes, she is, Nancy's on the call with us too. So uh, we, would, uh, we would invite questions on uh, the uh, AGR report. Andrew. Um, this is a pretty big report and I, I hope someday things will change enough that this will be obvious, but I guess this is a large and significant enough report for me to say that, um, to feel the need to say that my, my lack of specific detailed questions here is no reflection that I don't think it's important, or I, I mean, you, you know, if something bugged me, I'd ask. I, I think the, the report is very good. It was certainly a, a you know, there, I, I guess what I'll say, and I'll keep it, I'll keep it quick, is there are, you know, especially at the end of, you know, the end of last year, and I, and I think people are starting to come around to realize that emergency virtual learning last year is is different than the much uh, the more robust virtual learning that we had time to plan for, right? But we we tried. We put books in kids' hands. We put Chrome. We put Chromebooks in kids' hands when kids didn't have a Chromebook. Um, we mailed them Chromebooks, shipped Chromebooks, even though we didn't have to, the state didn't make us. And there are, there are districts, um, there are districts that chose not to try. And, um, and we did. So I guess that, and with that, I'm, though we don't have a measurement for that, I'm sure uh, because of, because of cutoffs and no testing happened after them, surely our kids with, those options of getting the Chromebook mailed to them. I had a better opportunity to make up some of that ground, certainly than if they were in a district that didn't even try to continue anything. And I, I appreciate that uh, as well. So thank you. Christina. Sorry, um, Vicki, for the each of the individual school summaries, how is that shared with teachers and is it shared with uh, parents of with students in those schools? That's a great question that I, I don't know the answer uh, for the parent piece, but and I'll have to verify on the teacher one. I would suspect that this is something that's shared in their staff meetings by the principal. Um, the work is done by the teachers, so I would hope that they're aware of what the results are. But I'll verify that, Ms. Shelton. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, just because they, I mean, you know, just because they do the work, they might like to see a summary of it, you know, just in front. So it's a reflection of their hard work. Um, the other thing is, is there an executive summary of this or is this the only, not only, but is this, is this it? That's, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks.
So just uh, moving forward, if you remember, one of the things, uh, Eric and Christina, that we talked about uh, at our agenda setting meeting is uh, the team is uh, diligently working with me to develop a uh, more comprehensive calendar of annual work. Uh, and one of the things that we recognize is sometimes uh, receiving these items in isolation makes it harder to understand the context for it. Uh, so as we look to aggregate some of those reports into a more comprehensive report, um, that'll give us that opportunity to create that kind of executive summary that we just you just talked about and to tie some of those reports together that you might have otherwise received in isolation. So um, Nancy and Vicki and, and other folks on the team right now are working to identify those reports so that we can uh, put them together in a, a more uh, com uh, comprehensive compendium. All right. Thank you, Board President Van All right. Thank you. That takes us to number nine on our agenda, and that is our Intercity Student Council report. I'll hand it over to Lucas and Noah. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, at the district level, uh, sports and other extracurriculars have been figuring out uh, creative ways to meet and encourage new participation in various different um, extracurricular activities. The Intercity Student Council itself, elections will be held shortly, and the new ICSC will meet first on uh, September 27th to elect its officers for the school year and to start up new business. And across the district, online school has been seeing success with the kinks kind of being worked out as we progress through September. And as previously mentioned, um, kind of the difference between this and the very um, kind of chaotic situation that happened in spring with so little notice, uh, the improvement has definitely been noticeable and mentioned across the district. Uh, at Southwest, uh, students Annabelle Dennis and Alyssa Sprasio qualified as semifinalists in the 2021 National Merit Scholarship Competition, and Southwest has started uh, auditions for their fall play. Uh, at West High, uh, student council elections are being conducted uh, with the first ever use of instant runoff voting, which is very exciting. Uh, West students Noah Becker and Xander Newman qualified as semifinalists in the 2021 National Merit Scholarship Competition. And a number of West High uh, students found great success in an independent seven on seven football tournament with their team winning uh, 56 to 10. Uh, at Preble High School, Ashley Wolf, a uh, uh, Preble sophomore, uh, recently helped her um, under 14 fast pitch soft, softball team win the United States Specialty Sports Association National Championship. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Meter qualified as a semifinalist in the 2021 National Merit Scholarship Competition. At East High School, uh, sports practices have started up virtually in many cases. Uh, their fall play is starting and the GSA is meeting again. At, um, lastly, at JDAL. Uh, last spring, as has already been mentioned to the board, they held their event night, which is where project-based JDAL students present what they've been working on uh, to families and the public. That already happened last spring. And because that was such a success, uh, plans are being developed for uh, next event night to um, happen in a similar in a similar fashion. And JDL also has adopted a schedule that meets uh, the various needs of, of that school with a lot of different things going on. And they've got a schedule that has been working very well uh, from all reports. I guess that sort of applies to a lot of our other schools too. They've kind of figured out the schedule that's working best for, for them and have kind of tailored the schedules for their individual schools. And that concludes our report. All right, thank you very much to Lucas and Noah. All right, uh, then we'll go to the legislative liaison report and that'll be facilitated by Brenda Warren. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> the first thing, um, I would move that the uh, WASD resolution as presented be approved. Is second. There a sec okay. Second. Um, so what I did was I've, I attached both and as you'll see the um, 
the one we're voting on uh, is the Green Bay Area Public Schools mascot resolution. Um, it basically took what Wausau had already written in their resolution and, um, and made it ours. And um, we will be submitting this if, if it passes, um, we'll submit it, this to the Policy and Resolutions Committee in support of um, Wausau's resolution. So essentially we'll be a co-signer of, of this resolution. And then it'll go forward again to the Delegate Assembly in January, um, where hopefully it'll get a little bit more discussion than it had last year. Are there any? No, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. President Van Turman. I guess, um, so by you sub, like submitting your own, is this kind of just the way that you, in, in WASB, is this kind of the way you would co-sponsor a resolution as a district is by submitting your own version of it? Yes. Yeah. That okay, was that makes sense. I just wanted to yeah. know like if that the was goal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I checked with um, WASB, uh, Dan Ross Miller, and um, this is what he recommended that we do in order to co-sponsor Wausau's resolution. Any other um, discussion? Oh. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, I was just gonna see if there's any other discussion or anything else that you wanted to add before we vote. No, I don't have anything else to add. All right, Beth. Coy. Aye. Shelton? Aye. Becker? Aye. Smith? Aye. Sitnikau? Aye. Warren? Aye. Vanden Hoopa? Aye. Motion passed 7 0. All right. Um, and then next, uh, I have a couple of updates under um, the state, and I attached a few articles. Um, under, under in our agenda on that, um, and essentially, the um, so the the state report currently from the legislative fiscal fiscal bureau is that the um, state uh, tax collections are are not as actually they're slightly up from the um, uh, previous year, and. Um, and so our, our tax collections are, are not as bad as feared at this point. Of course, that could change. And um, so John Nygren um, submitted, a um, he, he's on the Joint Finance Committee and he just made some comments um, the end of August, basically saying that just, um, you know, schools need to be uh, aware of their, their cash trying to save money this year. So potentially they have more cash on hand next year. Um, I'm assuming that, you know, in order for us to do that, of course, is um, to put any cash on hand we have in the um, uh, fund balance. But, um, and then also acknowledging that the PPE costs are, are higher. Um, and, um, and, uh, Anyway, just just kind of making making us aware of things that we already knew, but I just thought I'd I'd um, highlight that. And then um, next is uh, there's a um, the governor tried to uh, pull together a group to look at um, police reform, and um, that didn't go anywhere. And uh, simultaneous to the governor's announcing that they were, he was putting, or that the governor wanted to have a committee on that, um, Representative Voss is putting together his own committee. And, um, and according to him, they'd be creating a task force on racial disparities, public safety, and police policies. And then also he added um, the topic of educational opportunities to that list that this task force might be looking at. Um, and according to WASB, they're, they're going to be watching this carefully. They're um, concerned that educational opportunities, again, is a, um, uh, a chance for this committee to talk about opening up um, more parental choice options uh, like vouchers and open enrollment. So that's something just um, to, to keep tabs on. And then um, 
And then last, the, um, the CARES Act, um, Secretary of Education uh, DeVos um, put forth, as I think I, I talked about this before, she wanted the um, CARES Act money to go to private schools based on their enrollment rather than based on their Title I students that they have in their school. Um, so this was the third decision by a judge um, that was recently uh, last week. Um, and this one, the other two were, were in states. This one is um, applies nationwide and um, basically saying that it was clear from the from Congress that this money was to go to schools in proportion to their Title I students and not um, and not for all students. So at this point, that's um, I don't think there will be any more appeals. In fact, it um, uh, they dropped the um, they dropped the ruling. Um, so the uh, CARES Act that was originally intended will be uh, dispersed based on Title I enrollment. And uh, if there are no other questions, that's, that's all I have today. All right, thank you, Brenda. Uh, next on our agenda, we have a motion uh, to transfer a staff. Would somebody be willing to read that motion? I move that the transfer of Melinda Capinos, administrative intern at Eisenhower Elementary School, 190 days as listed um, to interim elementary associate principal at Eisenhower Elementary School, 11 months at a salary of 78,996, group 10, 86 percentile, prorated to, to $68,706, effective September 15, 2020, as presented, be approved. A second. Beth? Becker? McCoy? Aye. Shelton? Aye. Zitnikow? Aye. Smith? Aye. And in Hubo? Aye. Warren? Aye. Pass uh, 7 0. Uh, the next is a school psychologist assistant job description. I move that the school psychologist assistant job description as presented be approved. A second. Beth? Um, oh, oh sorry. Yep. Have a little sorry, discussion Rhonda. on this. Is it, yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, is there, can you just explain a little bit more about what this person would be doing? And is it one, it's one position? And yeah, see if it, Terry is on here. No, uh, oh, or if Terry wants to jump in, that's fine. Um, it it could be multiple people. They would be uh, hourly. We would bring them in to help support special education evaluations, doing the pieces of work that um, teachers might instead be spending time directly with the student. So these people would be helping with the paperwork part. Who's doing that now? Uh, schools, um, the school teachers, um, the school psychs, the special ed team at district office. Okay. Eric? Yes, go ahead, Brenda. Sorry. Um, I just have a quick question because I um, was not familiar. We had, we're using FastBridge in our um, district. And number six on the list under essential functions says roster students into FastBridge. I'm just wondering what, what that is. I will have to ask Claudia to provide us with a summary of that, Brenda. Okay, thanks. All right, if there is no other questions, Beth? Shelton? Aye. Smith? Aye. Warren? Aye. Andon Hubel? Aye. Jitnikow? Aye. McCoy? Aye. Becker? Aye. Pass 7 0. Uh, going on to the consent agenda. 
I move that the consent items as presented be approved. A second. Beth. Pitnikow. Aye. Smith. Aye. Warren. Aye. McCoy. Aye. Andon Hubel. Aye. Shelton. Aye. Becker. Aye. All right, past seven zero. Uh, moving on, future agenda items. I know there were a few things that came up tonight, uh, talking about food and services to students. Uh, so we'll talk to Steve about that. Um, anything else? Rhonda? Would it be possible to have an, kind of an um, overview of the logistics around the sub? process the substitute um, teaching situation in in our in our off-site virtual or even in actually frankly in anything that we end up doing um, in the future as well as um, that's one thing and then I'm also interested in knowing do we have any dollar figures for PPE as far as if yep, we, we were to move in i know we have some obviously in, with going with people some people in the buildings right now but um what is the dollar figure moving forward if we were to go to a blended or in-person option and i would assume there has to be some savings happening somewhere considering we're not occupying the 40 some buildings so just yep we can what that we can picture definitely. would look like i would like to see that yeah. if possible and bringing both subs and that PPE ex expenditure. Thank you. All right, uh, not seeing anything else there. Uh, upcoming board meetings, just a reminder, get on everyone's calendar that we'll meet again to, to discuss gating criteria a week from Monday. And then our regularly scheduled meetings, uh, October 12th and October 22nd or 26th, excuse me. All right, um, unless there's anything else, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 All right, Beth. McCoy. Aye. Andon Hobo. Aye. Becker. Aye. Warren. Aye. Smith. Aye. Aye. Shelton. Aye. All right. And that concludes our board member board meetings past seven zero. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. You have been watching the Green Bay Area Public School District's Board of Education meeting. Please visit the school district's website, www gbaps.org to view the program again. If you cannot fully access the information on this video, please let us know the accessibility issue you are having by calling 920-448-2025 or by email at communications at gbaps.org. We will try to provide the information to you in an alternative format and or make the necessary improvements to make the information accessible.